So I'd say we just make it start now. Right, so um, official good morning. Um, I'm Elizabeth Kugler, I'm a YouTube tutor today and I did my PhD at the University of Sheffield and this is kind of the, the stuff we're mainly going to talk about today. But I'm now postdoc at UCL, um, so I've kind of moved on and the, the background that you see is from my work in, at UCL now. Um, so, like I said, we're trying to keep today quite casual and it's really important for me that we all kind of learn something. So I'd rather have you guys just interrupt me, ask a question, uh, drop it in the chat, however it's kind of really most convenient for you. Um, during this session, I will monitor the Zoom chat as well as the Slack chat. So in case someone drops out, the internet connection loses or something, I have both channels open as well as my email, but I'd rather have um, Slack and the Zoom chat. So I just have two things to look at. Um, and yeah, if there's anything, like I said, always feel free to just say, like, I didn't understand, or can we just repeat that, etc. cetera, because um, it's really important that we all kind of are on the same page and not kind of lose someone um, in the process of it. Um, also, there are no stupid questions, definitely not, because especially for us, well, it's really early, I appreciate that um, it is a lot to take in. So again, just feel free to, to have an interruption and just say, didn't understand, can we repeat, um, or whatever. Um, the next thing that I will do is actually play a short video while I do some admin and check all the chats, etc. Um, so that I run that. So if you have already questions, you can already drop them into the chat. But before we start, I just want to check um, if everyone is all right um, has, and has downloaded the data. That would be great. Um, if you haven't, I'm going to drop the link in a second into the chat so you can still download them now. Um, but we had some issues with people actually taking longer um, to download them. Hi, Jan, now we can also see you, that's nice. Um, so, um, and also yesterday we had, um, after about half an hour issues with the internet connection. So if that's the case, we just all turn off the videos just to increase connection, um, especially for those who work from home and have uh, not the, the best connection. So we all kind of um, are with that. We um, have the chat function at the bottom, so you can drop things in there, but also we have the reaction. So, um, Especially when we give the short introductions after this short video that I play, you can kind of applaud your, your uh, colleagues. And yeah, so we're trying to really keep it um, very, very casual. Does that sound all right? Has anyone got issues so far or is everyone okay to start? Oh, it's good. Cool. Um, brilliant. Then I just start sharing a um, quick video here. And that's basically um, giving you a little bit of background about what we're going to be doing. So this is a very short presentation to introduce you to the background of the project, but also to give you a brief overview about the tutorial. So in our lab, we're using the zebra fish to study brain vascular development. And so for those of you who have never seen a zebra fish, this is what an adult zebra fish looks like. So this is a female and they're about two centimeters in size. However, we're using the embryos to really study vascular development and disease. And this is what the embryos look like. So this is a four day old fish and we look at the side view. So here would be the brain, the eye, the yolk, and this is the trunk. And so using zebra fish, what we can do is actually produce transgenic lines, like you can see here, to visualize tissues of interest with incredibly high specificity. And in this case here, it is actually the vasculature of this very same fish that we see here on the left. And so to visualize these data in our transgenic lines, we're using light sheet fluorescence microscopy, which is a technique where we have an uncoupling of the excitation and the mission beam. And we actually excite a complete focal plane by using a light sheet and acquire this whole focal plane at once with this um, uncoupled emission objective. And so using light sheet microscopy, what we can do is actually penetrate quite deep into the tissue and therefore have a quite large depth of image acquisition, which is visualized here when we zoom in on the brain masculature. So here would be the midbrain and the hindbrain would be sitting here. Here is the right eye and this is the left eye, so it's just rotating around. And so now it's kind of looking at the dorsal, so left eye and the right eye. And this whole section is about 700 microns wide and about 400 micrometers uh, in depth. And so being able to visualize these data is really meaningful and very useful to us. However, this leads us to something that we call the data analysis bottleneck. So we have a lot of biology questions, experiments, and a lot of light sheet data. 
but now is really the question how we can bridge this gap from image acquisition to, to really having quantifiable results and this is where data analysis sits and this is really where, where my main work is in being embedded and specifically in our lab this means that we have a lot of data especially in vascular development so for example in two and three days we can see that the vasculature growth so the brain grows in size however it's unclear if for example there's a diameter size length or branching points are changing and this is even more challenging when we look at more subtle differences for example here where we have a control fish and one fish being treated with a anti-cancer drug so this one is a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor which is meant to reduce vascular growth but just by looking at these images it is really beyond any human perception to say if there is a difference or not and so what we need is a computational workflow to really extract meaningful parameters as shown here, so branching points, volume, surface, radius, etc. To really describe the vascular chain, see how the vasculature is, is being um, developed and what really its topology is. And so to do this, we have developed a workflow which is consistent of four main steps. The first one is image segmentation, the second one is registration, the third one is quantification, and the fourth one is biological application. If you're interested to learn a little bit more about them, you can also look at our bioarchive paper, which has really a little bit more detail on them. But for today, I'll give you now an introduction about the individual steps and then what we're going to do today. So firstly, in terms of segmentation, this really um, encompasses how to understand your original data. So our data in 3D, but obviously we look here at them in 2D. And so what we need to understand is really how do the data look in three dimensions? What is their signal? What is their properties? Is there any motion artifacts? And how can we really improve and enhance our data in a step called pre-processing, which improves the vascular signal and reduces the non-vascular and non-specific signal? By this pre-processing or improvement of our image quality, we can then perform image segmentation, which is a binarization process to extract the vessels. And this here is shown as a lookup table for depth, so the different colors show different depth, but it's really a binarization process where we set the vessels to one and the background to zero. Building on this segmentation, we then have image registration, which is a method to bring different embryos into one spatial coordinate system. So if we do the imaging, the fish look like this, but we actually want to be able to compare them. And so we try to overlap them, as we can see here in 2D, and this is 3D. And by this overlapping and bringing them into one coordinate system, we can then actually study regions of similarity and variability as shown here. So regions of similarity are shown in yellow and regions of variability are shown in blue. Moving on from this, we then want to quantify these uh, different vascular parameters, which I've mentioned before, in the step of quantification, and then apply to different biological questions, such as vascular development, disease, or treatment. And so to actually being able to share this workflow with the community, we have implemented everything into Fiji. And we also supply a graphic user interface, as you can see here, which has all the different steps of this workflow. And so users can just have a drop down menu of choosing what they want to do. So you would just select this to yes or no. Sorry, my mouse is just jumping around. I just put it aside. Um, and so using this graphic user interface today what we will do is actually we will focus on four main parts of image processing the first one is to understand our original data so we'll look at them in 3d and assess how we can quantify image properties we will look at image pre-processing using our graphic user interface and we will also work on image segmentation as well as the quantification and so we will kind of focus on these four points but if you have questions on the other steps please feel free um, to ask them either in the chat or later on we will have plenty of time to really do a lot of discussion. And so to actually make it more interesting and really show you why this, uh, all this quantification is important, what we will do is apply to true biological data. And in this case, it is data where we look at how blood flow is impacting vascular patterning in the brain. And we can do this because fish can survive up to seven days without blood flow. And so we can engineer them or their DNA in a way that they don't have hard contraction and therefore they have never blood flow. And yet if we look at these fish, so this is a control and this is one fish without blood flow, we see that even at three days, these fish without blood flow, also called TNNT2 morpholinos, 
have really changed vascular patterning. And so we will examine how this lack of blood flow does impact different vascular parameters. And at the end of the tutorial today, we will hopefully have all these different quantifications of vascular volume, surface, density, branching points, network length, and average radius. We will have two groups, so we will have an uninjected control and a TNNT2 morpholino. And we have, for the sake of time, not included the control morpholino, but this would be in an experimental setup, another group which we would examine here. And so with this, we'd hope to really kind of look a lot into this data analysis bottleneck and really examine the different steps of, of data analysis, including image understanding, enhancement, segmentation, quantification and visualization. And so with this, I kind of now want to go into the tutorial bit and talk about the individual steps that we're going to do a little bit more. Um, when we come to the individual steps, we will talk about them a little bit more in detail, but I thought I'd give you now a very brief overview about the individual steps that we're going to take today. And then, like I said later, we're going to talk about them a bit more in detail. So firstly, like I said, we're going to look at data understanding because we work or we look at our data in 2D, but we work actually in 3D with our data. And so we're using the 3D viewer to look at our data in 3D. And we will start to understand how different voxel properties actually impact your data because when we look at our data, we think in, in pixels and voxels and they are often assumed to be a cube, but actually often they are a rectangle, which means that in X and Y, if we look at our voxels, they might look like a cube, but actually in 3D, they are, um, they are longer than they are in X and Y. And all this will make more sense when we actually look at it, but we will talk about why this actually matters. We will then also look at how to objectively assess image quality by a measure called contrast to noise ratio, which is a measure that if it's very high, it's easy to distinguish your signal from your background. If it's very low, it's very hard to distinguish visually as well as computationally what is a vessel and what is background. And we will do this quantitatively by using manual measurements. We will then look at how to improve and enhance our image qualities and there are various different methods to do this but today we're actually using a vascular specific method which actually assumes that your vessels are tube or line and so everything that is inside this tube or line or vessel will be enhanced and everything that is outside will be being suppressed and I don't want to go into the maths but if you're interested this is based on the Hessian matrix and using SATA enhancement and again, we will talk about this a little bit more at the actual step when we will do it. Going on from the enhancement, we will then do the segmentation, which is this binarization process. And in our case, what we're using is a, a histogram based method. So if you look at your image, it has different intensity distributions. And if you do look at the histogram, which is basically plotting the different intensity distributions and their frequency, as we can see here, what it will do is try to find two clusters, namely vascular and one background cluster, and then really distinguish all the voxels to be actually um, vascular or background. And this is what we see here. So this would be the input and this would be the output. And in this case, we use a threshold method called OTSU thresholding. But again, there would be different methods to do this. Because also we look obviously at different fish and fish can have different sizes and we might image them at different angles, etc. What we want to do is actually extract the so-called regions of interest or ROI or ROI. And we will do this manually to actually extract regions such as here the eyes or some background which we all like some vessels which we're not really interested in. And this selection of this region of interest when we apply to the different fish, it allows us then to actually have comparability between the different images. So if you'd imagine first you image the fish at different angles and maybe different positions, the selection of the region of interest will make these images more comparable. We then move on to actually look at the quantification. And in our case, what we do the first step after having segmented and selected our region of interest is actually to extract the vessel center lines. So here, what you'd see is in red, the, the vessels and in yellow, we actually look at the center lines. And the center lines are basically 1D or one voxelized representation of your data. And we will achieve this by skeletonization or center line extraction with a method which is based on iterative thinning. So iterative thinning takes basically your object and it always peels out the outer layer until there's only one voxel left in the center, which is here shown in red. 
and this is what your skeleton is. And the skeletonization then allows you to extract the length and, for example, the branching points, as you can see here, because we can now extract the bifurcations or the branching points in our vessels. Moving on from that, we will use a so-called Euclidean distance map to look at local thickness or vessel diameters. And the way this works is that it uses the object, so the binarized object, and looks at the local thickness. And this is basically um, achieved by looking at how far different voxels are from the object border, so how far are they away from the background. And if we look at this example from MathWorks, what we see is that, for example, here in the horse, where we have a thinner leg, we will get a lower intensity, but the body is actually quite thick, and so we get a higher intensity. And so this intensity actually represents the local thickness or vessel diameter. And so when we apply this to our images, as you can see here, the higher intensity regions in yellow, they actually show us where the vessels are thicker, and the thinner ones are being the darker ones. And so we already have an approximation of how thick or thin the vessels are. But then to actually quantify it, we will combine the, the Euclidean distance map with the skeleton. And so we get a one voxelized representation of the individual vessel thicknesses. And this allows us to quantify the vessel diameter. And so with all this, like I said, we really hope to kind of engage all the different steps of data analysis with having this image understanding, enhancement, segmentation, quantification, and visualization. And so this was, again, just a brief overview, but we will talk about the individual steps a little bit more once we get to them in the tutorial. And just for kind of terms or in terms of administration, we have now finished my kind of brief introduction, and we will now have a little bit of time for questions on all of this. And the next step will be to do the introductions from all of you and to look at them. And this is the list for the, the schedule of all of you. And I will also copy this into the chat so you know when is kind of your, your turn to, to give the introduction. But with this, I also need to really acknowledge a lot of people who were involved in this project, especially my supervisors at the University of Sheffield, Paul Armitage and Tim Chico, who were really the main um, people involved in this project that I'm presenting here today. And so with this, I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Um, do we have questions already? Actually, right. oh, sorry, go no, for you it. No, you first, you first. No, no. no, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually was wondering because I, I work with vessels too, and I had never seen uh, the, the vessels, the enhanced vessels of zebrafish. And during development, it seems to me that you don't have a lot of, of variation in the size of the vessels, so in diameter of the vessels. I, that, that reduces a lot the complexity, for example, yes. of the skeletonization problem and and also all of all of the measurements. Do you find that that this method is perfect only for that case, or do you think that it is possible actually to to also so, use it for more more complicated scenarios? Um. So yes, I know what you mean. So fish and at the ages where we look, the good thing is that most vessels are more or less the same size, and so they range from about five micrometers to about 25, which is really very narrow scale. Mm. Whereas, for example, in human patients, we work really from micrometer to centimeter size, so mm. the scale difference is definitely an issue. Um, I would say it's not that much of an issue for the actual skeletonization or the, the quantification of parameters. It's more the actual extraction, so this enhancement, where we're going to look at um, a little bit later. What we do is we apply one filter, um, the SATA enhancement, which has um, a scale size of 10 because it's kind of optimized for, for our vessels. Um, however, um, it should be a multi-scale approach, but sometimes it doesn't fully work on different multiple scales. And so to do this, you can actually run multiple scales and then integrate them. So there would be a different filter, which is called Frangi enhancement, which is thought to work better um, and was originally developed for humans. However, we find that the implementations which are in Fiji don't really work too well on our data. But again, they were developed for MRI, CT, human patients, and we work mm. with fish fluorescent image. So it's a very, very different. Yeah, it's very different data. Um, but yeah, you can try and have like a multi-scale approach to get the enhancement and then the segmentation and everything that follows um, is, is less dependent on the vessel yeah. scales. Because, because I had a, just a very fast additional question subsequent to that. So 
I saw also that this, even in the original signal, before you enhance it, they almost seem filled as filled tubes, these vessels. Um, do you think, I mean, uh, yeah, the question is, did, did you actually uh, elaborate it, uh, an imaging strategy on purpose to have them that way, to avoid filling them up? Um, we can actually, um, if people don't mind, um, I quickly um, talk about it. Um, I just open something and then I can quickly show you what we do at the moment. Well, Elizabeth looks for that information. Everyone, if I ask too many questions. Um, no, that's fine. We you, have you about two, in, three please, minutes. We have two, three do, minutes. Uh, please and do. then we can move on. Also, two, I think two people actually dropped out. Um, oh. So we have a little bit more time. And again, I think the main thing is really to discuss things um, and everyone learn something. So, so the question is basically, um, are the vessels filled or not filled? And this is something, so in MRI or in, in okay. human and a lot of mouse data, what we do is actually we look at perfused vessels. So in, in human, for example, we inject um, a, um, what is the word? Thing into the bloodstream, I can't remember, I'm sorry. Um, and then basically in human patients, what you get is a signal like this, if you look at the vessels. Same for a lot of mouse data where you inject um, something into the bloodstream and then you fix them, you often get distribution like this. However, if you have, for example, angiography, thank you, Jan, um, that's the word. And um, in a lot of uh, fish experiments, but also mouse experiments, what we do is actually we use antibodies against the membrane of the endothelial cells, which outline the lumen. And so we get more of a distribu distribution exactly. like this. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to consider both cases because obviously there will be vessels which are non-perfused um, or, for example, not luminized. So in fish, we actually have both. We have this distribution, but also more of this distribution. So if they're okay. luminized, they're large and nice. And if they're unperfused, they look more like this. And so with this SART enhancement, what we've tried to do is actually get all of them to this stage so that all of them would be artificially filled. Um, but because we first thought we could kind of unfill all of them, but that was actually computationally very different. So that's what we're trying to do. And I don't know if it's in this one. Okay, so the SART enhancement not only uh, enhances the signal itself of tubular structures, it also closes them up. So that's what we've tried with this certain scale. Yes, if you would apply okay. a different scale, you could enhance the edges. But we, like I said, went for actually filling all of them. Okay. Um, so they're all the same, basically. But you can have a play. And, and the scale size is really the most important thing because you can artificially shrink your vessels and it can artificially blow them up. So oh. that is the most important thing to look at. Good. Thanks. You're well, welcome. Do we have another quick question? Yeah, it's just a quick question. Uh, normally, when users for that go and use light sheet, they normally do the registration first and then they do all the processing part. So in this case, you did segmentation first and then registration. Why is that? Was it, it's because it's easier in your case? So, um, so there was no registration first for sort of, or at the start of for seborrheic, and one of the main reasons is that the vessels are actually very sparse. So if we look at the data, or like an image where we have the vasculature, only about maybe 10, 15 percent of the voxels are vascular. And so for any processing, that makes it very, very difficult because obviously everything there's more background than actually information, and so that makes it very challenging. And so what we uh, looked at is actually two different registration methods. One is based on manual placing of landmarks, so for example, left eye, right eye, so very simple landmarks. But this is obviously very laborious, so we wanted to have something automatic. And we can only drive our automatic registration based on data which are already segmented. And that's why we do it after the segmentation and then have the registration. Yeah, makes makes more sense. All right. Um, cool. If um, everyone is all right with that, we can then move on to have like the brief introduction so we all get to know each other a little bit. Um, and like I said, I think um, Sin and Rashid aren't here. At least I can't see them on the screen. Um, and so the first person would be Betty Miranda to tell us who you are, why you're here, um, and what you're working on. I made a tiny PowerPoint show. Is that really keen, or was I supposed to do that? 
you can do it if you want as long as you stick to two minutes I'm okay i'll go really fast i wasn't sure if i was supposed to all right hi everyone i'm miranda um hopefully you can see this uh, i work in the group of martyrs latich at the uh, lmb in cambridge and i just started postdoc there and we use these drosophila larva uh, or maggots um to look at how behavior changes the kind of or what networks are involved in different behavior of these larva and um, I'm actually using two photon uh, with holography to do this um, optogenetically. Um, so the idea is I stimulate neurons, see how this changes the um, synaptic structures and what uh, networks are involved in this. And then the group uh, usually uses uh, EM uh, with CAPME to reconstruct these uh, neuron networks. Uh, but I was hoping to, uh, now the group also had the light sheet, use light sheet potentially as well as this to see the differences in which methods have different advantages as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Kirsten. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Kirsten. I'm working at the uh, University of Helsinki in Finland in an imaging uh, core facility and supporting researchers which are doing biomedical research and uh, some of the groups are also uh, looking at uh, vasculature, mainly in uh, mouse. And we have some groups who are doing like mouse brain uh, vasculature uh, with light sheet microscopy. And so therefore I thought I could learn a few maybe tips and tricks for how to uh, help them with their image analysis. Great, thank you. Um, Jan. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jan Chen. I'm a student in the University of Sheffield. Um, so I work on uh, blood vessel formation in zebrafish. To be, to be exact, uh, I'm interested in how blood flow um, interacts with signaling pathways during zebrafish uh, vascular remodeling. Um, but I'm more focused on the cellular movement of the vessel instead of the patterning. So I think this uh, workshop would be very interesting. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jan. And Hannah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm a third year PhD student um, at the University of Colorado here in America. Um, and I work with Dr. Julie Siegenthaler in her lab, and we study the development of the brain vasculature, perivascular spaces, and the meninges. I specifically study um, a type of fibroblast that associates with outside of the adult brain vasculature, and I study this in mice. Um, there's a lot about these cells that we don't know, particularly I'm interested in their development. And I've recently started to use optical tissue clearing to clear mouse brains in order to visualize the vasculature and these cells on the outside of the vessels. So I'm really new to, to um, looking at vessels in 3D and looking at images in 3D. So I'm hoping I can take away a few things from the zebrafish model to apply to my, uh, my um, optically cleared brains. Great, thank you so much. Um, Tatiana. Hi everyone, um, so I'm currently a postdoc in Megalysis and Steam in France, in Toulouse, and uh, I was trained as a physicist and I did my PhD at the Institut Curie uh, with Emmanuel Farge in Paris. And um, to realize image analysis, I designed a Python code, and during my postdoc right now, I'm trying to develop this code to 3D analysis. And so that's why I'm here. I'm really interested in like, improving my knowledge in 3D filamentary network analysis. So I think it's going to be great. Great, thank you so much. Um, I don't, is it Larry? Is that yes, Larry? yes, <laughs> it's yours. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Collet. I am currently here at university. I'm working at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and I finished my PhD at Kumamoto University, Japan. And now here in UP, um, we are working on different animal models, um, mice, zebrafish, and ducks. So for vascularization, we have used the CAM assay before CAM assay and the um, implantation assay in vivo implantation assay. So we're hoping we can learn 
from from here we can learn to apply it using those best uh, animal models and also for zebrafish we're working on zebrafish and we want to analyze changes in the whole insight to hybridization gene expression pattern that if we can also apply that in identifying the changes in the gene expression between different setups so thank you fantastic thanks and um, next one is Neela. Yes, hello, good morning. So my name is Neela and I've um, just started my first postdoc uh, in Berlin with a group of Holger Gerhard. Um, and we are looking at developmental vascular biology um, and therefore I will be mainly using the um, retina model of mouse. Um, and I'm trying to set up a nice workflow to use the light sheet microscope to actually image all three vascular layers um, of the retina, and then obviously also analyze it. Um, so this workshop really comes in handy to get me, yeah, to get a nice introduction of, of what to look for, what to do to establish a nice workflow. So once all is set up, I actually know what to do with it. So yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Anna? Hi, um, I'm Anna Ribeiro. I work in uh, Institute Cinema Molecular in Lisbon in the Leonor Wood Lab. And I work in uh, spinal cord regeneration in adult zebrafish. So we're trying to understand how vessels are important for spinal cord regeneration. And so the samples that I use are cleared uh, spinal cords and I use transgenic lines to look at the vessels. Um, and what I'm trying to learn in, with this course is try to see how I can do a more detailed characterization and automated characterization of the. Oh, there's some kidding, see? Uh, sorry, I have my kid here. Um, of the vessels, and also when we compare different experimental conditions, if I can have a more, a better way to um, quantify these differences. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, and also, don't worry, we're, I think most of us are at home. So, if you, you know, have cats, children, things. Don't worry, we're all at home. Um, I think just Neil is in the lab. Other than that, we're all at home. Um, next one is, is it Jutin or is it Jatin? Jatin. Jatin would be the pronunciation, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jatin. Uh, I'm a postdoc um, at the University College Cork um, in Lisbon Institute, which works with uh, gut microbiota and, and host physiology. So, I'm working on microbiota brain interactions uh, in the context of model systems like zebrafish and C. elegans. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so the, the incentive of being in this course was to sort of learn how to apply light sheet microscope and uh, use the data analysis technology methodologies to sort of um, um, look at something which I would look at uh, later on in the project, which I'm hoping to do here. So. The idea would be to um, look at uh, disruptions in early life gut microbiota in larval zebrafish and, and look at how brain development and brain vascularization um, uh, is impacted. So what I would like to learn is exactly what uh, Elizabeth is gonna teach, like how to analyze uh, 3D vascular networks in early developing uh, zebrafish brain. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, and I think then Shin isn't here. So the next one would be, uh, Nicola or Nicolas? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Whichever you would like, Nicola or Nicolas is fine. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm currently at my the start of my fourth uh, year as a PhD at KU Leuven in Belgium at Krista Mars Lab. Uh, and we actually work on the relationship between the vasculature and skeletal progenitors, so in the bone marrow. And I don't know if any one of you has any knowledge of bone, but since it's a calcified tissue, it's absolutely ridiculously difficult to put clear, stain, all of that imaging, amazing things that we can do are, are, are difficult there. So I sadly for the moment don't work with light sheet microscopy because I don't work with uh, seven, 700 micron thick sections as Elizabeth or, or many of you do. Uh, and I work with laser scanning, but I also work with these 3D vessels and 
I want to be able to do a lot more with them. And I think that learning about another uh, model where people are doing this uh, more complicated and intricate analysis is going to be very, very helpful. So very eager to know more. Great. Thank you so much. And um, Jordan. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Jordan. And I'm from the Philippines. I'm currently taking my PhD at the Institute of Biology at the University of the Philippines. I am part of the Animal Developmental Biology Laboratory where I, we work on studies related to zebrafish. Actually, I am fortunate enough to be here with my thesis advisor and lab head, uh, Ms. Larry Pulan. So today we're classmates. <laughs> and uh, for my previous research on zebrafish, it involves testing on toxicity and teratogenicity of various substances, including uh, different plant extracts that were collected and are endemic in our country. At the moment, my research interests include developmental and genetic studies on zebrafish, and also in the development of transgenic lines and zebrafish models for diseases. And I am very grateful to be here because I know that things that I will learn after these sessions will be really beneficial for me. And especially when I'm trying to visualize structures and uh, developmental structures found in zebrafish, I believe that it's really important that you have the knowledge to process image data. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's great when PI and student are both in the same session. That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, Shinpei. Hi. Um... Uh, my name is Shinpei Kubota, and uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of Tokyo in Japan. I can't see your screen yet. Oh, Sorry, it just says okay. Shinpei has started screen sharing, but I don't see the actual presentation. Right? Now Did you see? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, and uh, as a graduate student, I was working on the development of a tissue clearing method called Cubic. And this method is for uh, mouse, but I'd like to participate in this session to further develop uh, whole organ analysis of vascular system. So I'm very looking forward to uh, participate, participate in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful images. I love clear oh, tissue. Sorry. Um, yeah. I love clear tissue. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I think Rashid is not here. Um, so the next one is Jose. Yes. Uh, hi everyone. My name is my name is Jose Marx. I am a. You guys hear me, right? Yes. My I am a microscopy technician at the core facility in Instituto Gulbenkian de Ciencia in Oeiras, and uh, I am a biologist by formation, but I fell in love with uh, everything microscopy and image analysis. So I've been trying to learn more and more about image analysis as I go, because I think also programming, coding, and automation makes our lives much more easier. And it's so much fun when everything works perfectly and automated. You just click one button and everything goes your way. And then I think also the whole process of image analysis is really interesting in which we we look at images instead of just being pretty images we actually quantify and extract relevant information from them so that is why i've been working at this facility and i am also interested in this course because we also have users that you are using light sheet and hopefully i can translate some of the things i learned here back to my facility and they can and then i can analyze their images even better after this course thank you Fantastic, thank you so much. I think that's all of us. I hope I haven't missed anyone out, it doesn't seem so. So it's really great to see all the different kind of backgrounds and stages and interests, etc. cetera. Um, and so I think one, one common theme was like, when image analysis works is beautiful, but um, most of us know it takes a long time until it works. Um, and also um, that obviously light sheet data are quite challenging because they're quite large. Um, I'm today not really talking too much about actual light sheet light sheet per se but we will have enough time for discussions if any of you have actually questions about um setting up the light sheet or anything like that um please feel free to, to discuss it as well because obviously it's, the acquisition is also part of, of the processing if that makes sense right um so 
I think with this, we can then actually kind of start with, with moving into the practical session, if that's all right, if you're all set up. And um, so I've sent all of you the, the PDF file to just give you kind of a brief overview, and that's kind of what we've run through. But again, we'll probably make some changes as we go along, depending on what people are interested in and what really um, is useful to you guys. Because again, I just want you, you to really learn something. Um, but if you kind of want to just open on, on page three, the PDF, the first thing that we're going to do is actually download the data, um, open Fiji and make sure that we've got everything installed. So um, I hope all of you have downloaded the data. Please. Um, that will be great. Um, and then um, you can actually extract it into a folder. And then I, I briefly talk you through in a minute what actually the data look like. But the next thing is also to then open your Fiji and just make sure that you have basically the latest version. Um, and so just too many windows, sorry. And what we need to do is actually um, update the Fiji. So if you go on the top panel to help and then update, it will run an update. And then what we need to do is actually click on this manage side. So if, so if you click on the details, it will open this up. And then what we need is this neuroanatomy one. So they are ordered alphabetically. So you just scroll through neuroanatomy, um, apply this ticket, and then say close, and then um, just apply the changes, and then just restart Fiji. And we will need this neuroanatomy plugin to actually analyze the skeleton um, a bit more in detail later. Once you have all done that, if you can just say like a yes in the chat, um, that would be great. If you have any issues, again, just say um, no or, or just um, unmute yourself. At the moment, the internet connection seems stable. Great, that's most of us. Great. Um, and then the next step is to actually also download the code on, on GitHub. Again, I've um, copied the link into, um, into the chat function. Just trying to open it on my screen. Sorry, just a second. So on the GitHub, basically, to this link that I've copied, all that we need is to download this um, document too, which is the zip file for the individual macros. And then you can unzip that as well. And these are the macros that we're going to use. If you're interested into kind of the graphic user interface a little bit more and kind of the actual workflow step by step, we also have a workflow documentation here, but um, it's just very detailed. So I've left it for today, but if you're interested in um, that would all be here. <clears throat> Okay, and if you just again, just drop a yes or no, um, that's always good because um, you might get a bit of feedback. Great, thank you. Awesome. Right, um, so if you have extracted your data, you will have this folder called I2K data, 512 by 512. And this 512 512 is because the data actually downsampled. So normally in Lightsheet, we work with actually fairly large data. And because most of us work at home and we kind of want to speed it up, I've just downsampled them to make them smaller. Um, so the data that we look at here, they're actually not the full quality that they would normally be, but it's just for the sake of today um, that we can actually run it. If you're interested to in looking at the, the full size data, I will copy the link to full size data set um, into the chat as well, so you can have a go at them as well. Um, but I thought today we just um, keep it simple. So what you see in the actual folder Lisa, is... just one question before mm -hmm. uh, that. Uh, the, the data right now is downsampled, but only in the X, Y axis, isn't it? Yes, at the moment they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. 
and you didn't and, and, and you didn't do any normalization between data taken at different moments did you do you mean different fish or yeah exactly different different fish no, no so they're not so this is literally how we acquire the data and this is also what you see so some of them are at an angle others are straight and this oh, is really where we okay. use this registration and this is where we will use this region right. of interest selection so we'll right, talk through right. that um, so in the folder, um, we have uh, maximum intensity projections, which just give you a quick overview how the fish look like. So, for example, um, this one is a healthy control. It's just a little bit dim at the moment, but this is what we looked at before in the presentation. So we look at the back of the head, so dorsal view, and this is a three-day-old healthy fish. And so we have three healthy fish. So three DPF means three days old. Uninjected means healthy, nothing done to them, embryo four, five, and six is just the numbers of this experiment. And dorsal, again, is the acquisition from the back of the head. And then we have three fish which have no blood flow. And these are the ones which are called TNN T2, um, but you could call them whatever you want to make. And then again, you have different fish and again, dorsal of the acquisition. Okay, um, and so the first thing, because we obviously work with um, 3D data, is something that I would find helpful, namely to look at the data in 3D. And this is something that most people um, kind of overlook because they take it for granted. And then this is where really a lot of issues kind of creep in. So I thought the first thing is really to, to look at the data in 3D and understand how they look like. So if you just want to take one of the uninjected controls and just open it in PG, um, and it takes a second to load, and then we can look at them in three dimensions. So for those of you who work with 3D data, um, you know that we normally get a stack. So um, if you scroll through from the left to the right, this is what we call a stack. So it's individual X, Y planes. And we have um, a total of 425 planes here. Up here, we see the micrometers in size. So it's about 650 by 650. And we see here the XY um, dimensions, so the 512 by 512 voxels. But again, normally it would be like 2000 by 2000. So it's almost four times the size. It's 16 gigabyte, and this is um, the size. And again, this is very small for a light sheet um, acquisition, but this is again because it's down samples. Normally, it will be far, far larger, more in like two, three gigabyte range. Um, and so then if we scroll through, so in the, on the left, we start on the ventral path, which is where we look at the main artery. So this here is the basilar artery, which leads the blood into the brain. And this is one of really anatomical guide points for us because all fish do have this um, basilar artery. And if we go to about the middle, this is where we see the left brain, right brain, this is midbrain, and here would be the hindbrain. And um, so if we kind of scroll through further, we go to the dorsal part and these vessels here are really the ones which kind of cover the midbrain and the hindbrain. So these are the most dorsally positioned vessels. And then um, what really help, or what I find very helpful to do is actually look at them in 3D. So if you go to plugins and 3D viewer, you can just close um, any error messages and just ignore them. Um, you will see a panel like this, and I normally just leave the, the normal settings. So you can show it in as a surface, you can show it in the different colors, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that I find helpful and sometimes play around with is actually the resampling factor, because um, if you have, so this basically will make your data smaller or larger, so to speak, in the preview in the 3D. And if you realize that your data are very, very large or your computer is very slow, you can just resample this to four or five, etc., just to get a quick overview. If you want to look at more detail, you just have a resampling factor of one. But for now, we can just leave it um, and then we'll ask it to convert and we just say yes, because this is really now just to get a feeling of what do the data look like in 3D. And if we do this, um, we see that this is a little bit high intensity, but that's fine. And if we rotate it now, we really get this idea of what did the data look like. And again, it's important that these are the dorsal vessels, here would be the ventral part, and this would be here, this, this main vessel leading into the brain called the basilar artery. And so looking at this, it seems very simple, but it's very important because often a lot of people kind of forget, again, that your voxels are actually three-dimensional. And I will talk to you now why this is actually important. Because if we go to um, image properties, what it will show is actually the size of your voxels. And in this case, because it's um, resampled, we have um, larger width and height than actually depth. But normally, when you acquire your data, your voxels look more like this. So you have a shorter x and y direction than in z. So normally, your voxels are longer 
and they are white, if that makes sense. And this is called voxel anisotropy. And anisotropy um, can be an issue, especially if you don't think about it. And then you, for example, set your X and Y to, let's say, 0.3 microns, but your Z into one. So it's far, far larger in, in, in Z than it would be in X and Y. And so this is firstly, um, sometimes an issue if you look at the very fine structures, so for example, filaments, so it can, they can be broken up in the acquisition, but also computationally, if a voxel is like really a long cube, this can be very challenging for a filter which looks at 3D and thinks they're or like they're a cube, but they're actually uh, really a long um, thing. And so what can do is actually also play around with this and say, for example, you set all of them to one, um, one and one, and then do the, get the same again and just look at them in 3D. And then you will see really the difference why this is important. <clears throat> so now from just looking at this, they would look completely the same. But if we actually turn them to the side, we suddenly see that the fish is massively stretched. And we often see exactly the opposite, namely that fish are completely squashed. So suddenly people have like fish which are like really really thin and they're like what's happening and this is exactly the reason why so if you suddenly see that your fish has, has a really weird structure this is normally um, the case that you have something wrong with your voxel properties similarly checking your properties is important because um so if you go to properties again a lot of processing steps unfortunately change your your width and your height so they will they will assume that you have this cube rather than a rectangle and set everything to one by one by one and so you just want to make sure that this is preserved even even after processing steps and the same goes for your channels and slices and time frames and um, there are sometimes cases where these actually get switched around and so instead of having um 425 slices in depth you will have suddenly 425 time points but only one slice and just by looking at it like um scrolling through you wouldn't realize because it kind of looks the same to you but kind of just checking the properties is really a simple thing to avoid a lot of issues later on okay does this always make sense so far yes absolutely uh just one question again regarding that i'm so no, please, sorry that's what we're here for please go ahead <laughs> Um, it, I've, I've always wondered, uh, because some algorithms actually take this, uh, this property of not, uh, not having a, a, an isomorphic image very uh, hardly. So do you actually transform your images to be isomorphic before the analysis? Or uh, since, you're, since, since maybe your Z resolution is not that much apart from your X, Y resolution, do you, for example, in cases like this, just go for it this way? Um, so in our case, so for the data that we examined, it's all right to run them without, um, like, um, for example, that's what I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, interpolation, yeah. Um, because we acquire with like 0 0.3 by 0 0.5, so the difference isn't too large. If it would be like 0 0.3 by 0 0.8, then I probably would interpolate because then the voxel would be three times longer than they are wide. But in this case, it's like an offset of like 1.3, um, which is fine. However, um, I, for example, now switched to working with confocal microscopy and their obviously point spread function is severely um, an issue. And in cases like this, you want to definitely first have a point spread function deconvolution and really ensure that you have this best um, spacing if that makes sense yeah so you, you even go for the convolution even before starting the the analysis okay so in this case for these days i don't but for confocal i would do okay yeah. thanks okay um all right once we have done this um we can now actually um look at the data um, again in, in terms of like the contrast and, and the noise ratio and so I just closed this image and reopen it because it obviously changed the box of properties and so um, what we can do is actually examine this contrast to noise ratio computationally so this makes especially sense if you first want to assess how good or bad your image quality is so high again means good quality low means again very bad quality but also um, to examine really how this 
quality changes during certain steps. For example, if you do a deconvolution, if you do an enhancement, what happens to your image quality? Does it increase or do you actually make it worse? And so this is really a nice um, quantitative comparison to see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And um, so to do this, you can, I just need to move those windows, sorry, a moment. Um, so again, I just adjust the brightness with going to image, adjust color balance. And then what we would do is find a vessel which is very similar in our fish, because I would like to compare this contrast to noise ratio between my fish, right? And what I said before is that one of our main landmarks is really this basilar artery at the bottom of the fish, because we see this in really all fish so far, um, independent of treatment or mutation, all of these have shown this main vessel. But um, it's actually obviously quite difficult if you look at a different basket bed or a different region, you need to identify what is kind of what one vessel which you could compare between your data, between your samples. And um, so to quantify the contrast noise ratio, um, what we do um, is edit to or, or measure the intensity. And so to do this, we go to edit and selection at to manager. And what we do now is actually select the region of interest. And in this case, we just use one a circular ROI in one slice. Um, you could do it in three dimensions, but we found that it doesn't really make a difference. So. Uh, if we scroll through, the important thing is you need to find kind of the center of your vessel and then you can um, pose your region of interest. And actually, you'd first need to, or I convert it just to a bit just to show you. Um, and then you can analyze your histogram. And if you do this, what you see is you get these measurements. So mean is, for example, the mean intensity in the vessel. Standard deviation is just the standard deviation of, of, of the signal. And again, I've just limited to 0 and 255 in my 8-bit images. It, what you can do is then actually add this region of interest to your region of interest manager. Sorry, select the right image. And then you could save this and say um, you go to more and save and say, okay, this is my vessel image one or something like that. And then you would have saved this. Um, if you go to live in your histogram and actually move your region of interest, what you will see is that it live changes your intensities. And in the case of our measurements, what we want to do is actually have one position outside the vessel but inside the fish, because we know that some fish have a lot of water fluorescence, that if you do an antibody staining, you have sometimes a bit of background, um, you have your, your laser artifacts, et cetera, and all these will kind of have an increase in the tissue. And so this is where we use a mean signal in a non-vascular region. And we also measure the standard deviation of the background. And to do this, we basically place the region of interest somewhere really outside of the fish, but it's still inside the embedding medium. And so in our case, it would be agorized because again, it has a refractive index um, and the laser does have an, an, an impact. And so this is where we would measure our, um, our standard deviation. So um, normally if you do all this, you obviously can't add all of them to your contrast to noise manager, but I have done, so for the sake of it, I have actually measured all of them for you and already saved them. And so in your I2K data folder, if you have, uh, if you click into CNR uh, um, ROIs, you get these different um, regions of interest. We don't have to run through all of them. It's really just to show you how to do it. Um, and then I will talk through why it is important. But if you want, you can obviously run through all of them. If you have a, um, a set like this in um, Windows, you can just drag and drop it and it will actually sorry, open it automatically in your ROI manager. If you use a Mac, what you have to do is to go to more and open and then find your set. Um, we had yesterday an issue that someone actually had to open them manually, but normally that should just work. So just go to open and then open your ROI set. And to actually save a set like this, what you just have to do is just um, select all of them and then go to more and save, and then we'll, we'll set a, save a set. And we will save these sets because um, if we do some processing, for example, if we had enhanced these images, we later place the same regions of interest in the same fish and measure the, the signal again. 
in the station and compare how this looks like. And so basically what you then have is a, um, a, a file like this, where you have your fish, so in our case, the control and TNT2s, and then you have mean basket signal, which is what we've placed inside the vessel. You have a mean non-basket signal, which is inside the brain, but outside of the vessel. And you have the standard deviation for background. And let's say this would be 26, 6, and 0 0.05. And then to actually quantify a contrast to noise ratio, what you do is you take your mean vascular minus the mean non-vascular and then divide this um, by the standard deviation of the background. And what you get is a number, and this number is a contrast to noise ratio. In this case, it's a very, very high contrast to noise ratio. And high in this case um, means um, extremely high because in, in MRI or CT, the contrast to noise is about th uh, three to five, whereas here we have a 400. So this is really, really high. Um, and this is good, but also obviously it can be different in different transgenics, et cetera. And so one thing that we actually use this contrast to noise measurement for is actually to look, for example, at different transgenic lines. So these are three different transgenic constructs. And you can already see that, for example, this first one, which is the one that we use today, has a very good signal, very little skin or background. And these two have more background and more kind of artificial signal, as you can see, for example, in the eyes here. And so when we quantify that contrast to noise ratio, um, what we see is that this first one really has a very, very high um, rate and the other ones have very low and, and there are even some which have one or two. And so this is obviously more challenging computationally than this one. So this one is, is easier for the computer to analyze. And then we can also use it to look at contrast to noise ratio over time. So to see, does it change in development? And we actually do find that, for example, two days we have more background and this kind of um, evens out. And the same goes like for diameter. If we look at vessels with different sizes, we see that the contrast to noise ratio is independent of the vessel size in our case. But this is something, for example, that could be different if you look at a different staining or um, if you look at really, really large versus really, really small vessels. Whereas, like I said, we look at a range from like 5 to 25 microns. So that's very different. OK, so far, does this make sense? Are there any questions? Makes sense. Cool. Um, right. Great. If we are all happy, we can actually continue to the next step, namely to look at image enhancement. Um, so like I said, there are various different ways to do enhancement. Um, you can have and hand, or filtering with like medium filters, you can have subtraction of background, you can have various different methods. And I think one of the most important things is actually taking your time and finding what works with your data. And that obviously depends on, do you use live imaging or fixed images? Do you use um, antibody stainings or transgenics? Do you use young, fit or young tissue or old tissue? Do you use tissue clearing? Which microscope do you use? Which fluorophore? So it's, it's really, not like one thing fits all, especially if you think about um, some of us work with Drosophila, others work with, with ducks, others work with mice. It's, it's There is not one solution. However, um, like we briefly discussed, the SATA enhancement is optimized for vessel data. And so what it tries to do is, like I said, have um, assume that your vessel is locally achieved. And so there, um, so this one uses the HESA matrix and they go into the maths. Basically, this one enhances all the vessels, but it suppresses everything that's like a plate or a sheet. For example, it tries to suppress um, the, um, the skin signal, but also everything that's a blob or a sphere. So this is, um, for example, in antibody stains, this could be a speckle. And so it tries to really enhance just the vessels. So everyone who's working with vasculature or neurons or filaments, this one is a very good thing to look at. Um, however, this one, like we just briefly discussed at the very start, is really dependent on the size of the filter that you apply. And what we found yesterday is actually that um, I made a mistake because I was very tired. Um, so what we found is that because the data downsampled, but we applied our data 
or this this um, filtering with the same size as I would do to the full data, and what we saw is actually that it completely just over blew our images. And so this is something that is, is kind of really just highlighting how, how sensitive this is and how quickly you can artificially just create data which aren't there or artificially change data which, which shouldn't look like this. So today we, we just try um, to, to apply the filter with about half the size. Um, I didn't have time to run it through, but we just try and see what we get, which really just to show you kind of how the whole system responds to, to the different enhancement. Um, and so with this, we actually move now to opening um, the, the plugin. We can close everything else just to not confuse Fiji. Um, I've got a question there. The Sato enhancement, does it work directly on the voxels or does it work per 2D slice? So this one works in 3D. So this uh, works on the 3D structures, not on the slices themselves. Okay, okay. It's called tubeness filter in BG. And yes, there are yes. two okay. and there are two frangy implementations, but again, I, I found that it doesn't really work for our data um, very well, unfortunately. Okay. <clears throat> so if we go to our um probably download folder or whatever you've saved it, you have this file with individual macros. If you click into it, what we have is actually um basically a macro with loads of individual steps. Um, and the one that we're interested in is the last one, which says a graphical user interface, because this one in, um, integrates all of the other ones. And if you drag and drop it, you will get this graphical user interface. And um, if you say run, you will see a user interface like this one. And like I said, there are additional steps such as CZI to TIFF conversion, or for example, motion correction. Um, which we're not going to run today, but if you have questions, we can talk about them later. Also, um, the, co the code is online and open source, so if you want to change it, feel free to change it. Um, if you if you use it, just, just acknowledge us. And um, if you want me to make changes, I'm also happy to kind of work with you guys on, on helping you implement it for your data. So, for example, if you'd have um, Leica data instead of CCI, it's, it's literally we can just rewrite this, so this is not an issue. So things like that shouldn't... Um, like stop you from actually using it, if that makes sense. So, um, so the first step, like I said, would be CZI to TIFF conversion, which we don't need. The second one would be motion correction, which is important, um, especially if your um, sample is alive and it twitches and it moves, um, then you sometimes want to correct for motions inside the stack. But we don't do this now, but that what we are going to look at is actually this tubular filtering for vessel enhancement, which is the step number three. So to actually run it, what you can do is select yes. And this step here is the sigma size, which is basically the size of the filter. And um, like I said, we have optimized it for 10, which is the average size of the of the brain um, vessels. But again, if you work in a different tissue, you probably need to optimize your, your filter for something. So normally we would just run it um, with this 10, but like I said, we've downsampled data. So what I'm going to try now is actually just run it with five. So it's basically half the size and, and see what we get just for the tutorial today. So if you all just want to kind of change that, and then say, OK, then it will ask you for the input folder. And the input folder for your um, for your, for your enhancement is actually your original data. But before we run it, what we can also do is actually rename the data which are already there, because I've run everything for you guys already. So you should have a TF folder in your I2K data 512 by 512. And if you just want to rename that to I don't know, um, let's say one or something, then it doesn't overwrite it because otherwise you could potentially overwrite it and we don't want that. Okay, it doesn't let me do it at the moment. Never mind. If you can, do it, please. <laughs> okay. Once we have renamed the folder, then we can basically select the input folder. And um, it should basically be your I2K data 512.512, which is the TIFF files, which we just looked at before. And then you can say select, and then it should, should just start. And now it should run this vessel enhancement. It actually takes a little bit of time. So normally, if you work on full size, and just stop that for a moment, if you work on full size light sheet data, um, 
we found it takes about 40 minutes to run per image. So they are quite large and it's quite computation intensive because what this filter does is really it tries to basically make an abstraction of the whole image and the whole data. So it's computationally very, very expensive. So if you have a, a, like an image analysis computer, I would highly recommend to run it on there. Um, but because the data down sample, it should be fine to run on any laptop. Um, and again, this is kind of one workaround, which you can do if you see, especially when working from home, that you need um, you need to kind of downsample your data. That's always an option that you can kind of uh, work with. And again, we can downsample them in X, Y, Z, time, whatever works for you, whatever makes um, most sense. Okay. Are there any questions at the moment? Is everyone at this stage? Did we all manage to start it running? I missed the part about uh, the copying the folder, the TF folder. All right, so I'm kind of lost there. You can, i just show you again on the screen. Um, so in your I2K um, data folder, you should have a TF folder and you can yes. just rename this to TF to yeah. yeah you can call it whatever that's fine as well um <laughs> because what we basically just want to do is we just don't want to overwrite it in case someone is stuck at this step so because everything else is going to be in this folder just just to discuss through it later on as well okay and then and we select that as an input folder or the, yes, the input folder is the one above so the i2k data 512 yeah. 512 yeah, yeah, yeah. so these are the tiffs and we are going to yeah. write a new tf folder okay can you go back to the very beginning? I think I, I've missed something in this. So I can run the the script, but then I get a lot of error messages. So I probably need to select something at the beginning, right? Um, yeah, Do you? can you share your screen? Do you want to share your screen? Oh, I do it on the, on the other computer, so. All I'll... right, no worries. Um... I just start a second Fiji so I can show you because the other one is running now. Just give me a second. Um, so. So if you have your individual macros and you drag and drop it, then you have your graphic user interface. And then for the selection, you select tubular filter. So yes. I don't get that. Wait, wait a second. I do no have worries. my, so if I drag and drop it, I get this, um, I do have a view of, you know, it looks more like a code, but not do this. You have, sorry, do you have, Yes, the, this view. that one. Yes. If, if you click run, it should. So the run is just on the bottom. You should get this interface. Yes, I do have that now. Brilliant. And if you do that in here, you can change this. So the table filtering just say to yes. And then, like I said, we can change the sigma size uh, just because we haven't optimized for the downsampled one. So you can yeah. change it to five, you can change it to two. We can just have a play around with it now, um, whatever you want to do. And then if you say OK, it will ask you for the input folder, which is this 512, 512, so the original TIFF files. And you have the image open, so you don't open it afterwards. I think no, that's so my problem can... because I, I don't have an uh one of the images okay. no so that's the thing you can close everything else the thing that this will do is actually take the folder and open all the images in the folder and run okay. through them so you can close everything um if you want to run it on individual um files um the code for that should be in the folder for individual macros but i made it so it runs through a whole experimental set that ones um just to save time so if i click run now i have to select my new um my new folder i've created no so the, the one above so the sorry. tf this one so the i2k data folder not the tf one just the one above okay yeah 
and then open. Is it wrong? It does something, yes. That's always good. Something is always good. Okay. Um, I just st stop sharing again as well. Um, so does it run for all of us, or does anyone else still have issues? It's it's supposed to take some time, right? Yes. It's not immediate. Yeah. Okay. No, it's so processing. Me, yeah, it's gonna uh, take some time. I'm at image three right now. Um, so what I would suggest right now is actually have a five minute break for coffee, stretching our legs, um, get really a lot of coffee, um, and then just, um, yeah, come back in about five minutes and then uh, it will probably still run and we can just catch up from there. Okay? Okay, good. Works for me. See you in a bit. See you in, a See bit. in five minutes. Yeah. Bye. Great, that's most of us being back. Does anyone have any issues or error codes or anything at the moment or running smoothly? In running smoothly from me. Yeah. From me. Great, fantastic. That's what we want to be. Okay, that's most of us being back. So I would say um, we continue. Um, so it's probably still running for most of us for about two thirds through more or less. So um, before it kind of stops, what we can do is actually, oh, like I'll show you how to do it. And then once you're stuck, you can do it on your computer as well. But um, I'll show you how you can kind of get a first assessment of, of the, did the enhancement do anything. So one step would actually be to now do this contrast to noise ratio measurement again, um, but do it on the enhanced data. And what you should get is actually um, an image like the one that I'm just putting into the chat function and also trying to share it on the screen, but yesterday didn't work. So that's why I'm putting it in the um, chat. Oh, actually, it opens. Okay, so if you'd now place the same regions of interest in the fish, so the ones that we you saved or, or looked at before with, with um, in, in the original data, if we'd place them in our enhanced data and again quantify this contrast to noise ratio, what, what you would now see is actually that the enhancement increased and therefore improved the image quality by changing this contrast to noise ratio. But also we see it already visually, so if we just look at it and actually make it um, a bit larger, if we just look at it, what we see is that actually the, the, the signal inside the vessels is being improved or enhanced. And also we see that especially here inside the brain where we had this non-vascular region, we actually have a reduction of this. And so this is what we want to achieve. Any improvement should get rid of non-specific signal or background signal and any actual signal that we have should be improved. And this is what we want to see. But again, to do quantitatively, you could measure this contrast to noise ratio, for example. So that's one way. Yeah. There, why do you think that you have such huge standard deviations, so huge variation in your enhanced measurements? Is it because of the filter, like of, of the differences, for example, in size between uh, the diameter of, of different vessels in different samples? So this one is all measured in the same vessel with the same diameter. Um, I think so I'm not 100% sure why it is actually the case. However, I think it's just because we place only one region of interest in this case. But if we place a larger region of interest or two or three and would average it through the embryo, then that would be smaller. But if you uh, look at the examples that I've shown before, like here, we have actually a quite low standard deviation for most examples. But for example, at two days, we have a very high standard deviation. But this could obviously also be a thing because 
we select the embryos so they can have different levels of signal originally as well. So especially with fish, um, what can happen is that you can have multiple copies of your transgene construct. Um, and so we didn't correct for this, but for example, this could be one reason why we see these standard deviations. Because the thing is that you use, for example, uh, uh, um, you, you divide uh, with the standard deviation of the background, don't you? Instead of the mean of the background. Yeah. Which is something that I find actually strange. I suppose that you took that method from, from somewhere else in the literature. Yeah, so there are two ways to measure your, your signal. You can have, either have the signal to noise ratio or the contrast to noise ratio. And exactly. the formula that I've shown you is a contrast to noise ratio where yeah. you use the standard deviation of the background. But you could, for example, measure the mean of the signal minus the mean of the background, which would be your signal to noise. But if we do this, we see that's where we see a lot of fluctuation. And that's why we went for the contrast oh, noise. So you is see more fluctuation actually in the other measurements. Then. Yes. Right. OK. OK. okay. But this one is also because this one considers this non-vascular region. And I think that's the important thing because we work inside a fish. So, so considering this non-vascular region um, is very crucial for us. Yeah, the thing is that just by the way the formula is described, by reducing just a little bit the standard deviation of the background, you actually get a huge number because it's super small. Yeah. No, that, that's why you get all the, the, the thousands there because maybe you reduce a lot the, the standard deviation of the background. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But again, so you can, on your data, you can basically have a play around, but this is what we found the most consistent to be with, with the different data that we have. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, all right, so that's so that's one quantitative measure, but also I find it useful to actually look at your data visually. Um, and so to do this, I'm just trying to find my second um, instance, which is here. You can actually overlap your data as well. So if you go into your data folder, you can already, so you could open one of your fish, for example, I just uh, drag and drop one uninjected control. And then in my filtering, I would also take an uninjected, so the same fish, but now after this enhancement and drag it and drop it as well. Um, now this one has 16 bits and this one has 32. So I would convert, for example, both to uh, eight bits. And then just merge the channels. So image, color and merge channels and just select my two um, channels. And then if you go through, so I probably just used the wrong one because what we see here is actually that it over, over enhanced them. You can also change the um, colors, which I'm just trying to do here. Um, just make it clearer. And so if I zoom in and scroll through, what we see is actually that this one over enhanced it now, because again, the data down sample and I haven't optimized the sigma for it. So I, I just have to apologize for that, I'm sorry. Um, but what we see is if we go in, so in green would now be the states which are enhanced and in magenta are the original ones. And what we don't want, which actually happened here, is that we have the enhancement to be broader than the original data. So what you see is basically they now appear thicker than they originally are. And this is actually also quite a nice example to show again that you need to optimize each single step for your data types and that it is again dependent on, on your um, different data, different acquisition, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this, we find that this um, really optimizing the scale size is, is crucial to making sure that your data are properly um, enhanced. But this is also one step how you can justify it. And then obviously you could do some measurements of like how thick is this region versus the original one um, and just plot these sizes against each other. Okay, does that so far all make sense? Or is someone now completely lost and thinks, oh my God, what have we done? The overfitting was because our sigma value was too high. Yes. Um, so um, with this sigma, the important thing is that 
it kind of it really needs to be more or less the size of, of your vessels and so what we found is actually that if it's too small it would artificially enhance the edges of, of the vessel and if it's too large it would just blur them and this is what we've seen so it makes them artificially broader because it takes more signal into consideration and obviously one very challenging thing um, in um, microscopy or fluorescence microscopy and that we haven't really spoken about is the fact that there's a lot of signal that we actually don't see so if we go to just um, if we just look at one of the images and enhance the signal if we really ramp it up like this what we see is that there's a lot of, of signal which is not actually vascular but it's there in the image and so um, if we just look for example here we, instead of having a nice and defined edge you have like this blur or this halo around your data. And if you have a too large scale size, all of this would be enhanced as well. Would a median filter help improve our our tube filtering or not? Um, so what I found is that it doesn't work on our data, unfortunately. So um, uh, them. I can't remember if it was this one. So um, do we just see? But we actually, so we did look into having a median filter and like a rolling ball um, and seeing how this actually improves data quality. Um, sorry. So this is, this one first is kind of in response to the scale size. So this one actually shows how it's optimized. So where we have a scale of 10 for our vessels. And this was if we have a filter of 20. So you see it, it blurs it artificially. And this is what we examined here. Um, and this is basically the, the size of the vessel. So you see you artificially change it if you change the filter. And okay. to the answer of the median filter, we first tried a normal median filter and like subtracting the background um, and then applying different segmentation methods versus having this tubal filtering and then having different segmentation methods. And if you look at these two, what you see is that with the general filtering, you do get signal and it, it look, doesn't look too bad, but especially if you compare those two against each other, you see that um, with this tubular filtering, you're actually able to really discern very fine details, whereas with a general filtering approach, you would lose them. And that's why we went for this vascular specific filtering, if that makes sense. Yes, makes sense. I was wondering if we could apply a median filter then the tubular filtering, or does you can that do. just I mean compromises the data beyond repair? Um, no, it should be fine. The only issue, or like not issue, but I would be cautious because we have this signal in the background and the median filter, all it does is basically just smoothens it out. So it makes it even broader than it originally is. So the thing that I would probably go for is actually um, apply a rolling ball algorithm to subtract the background first and then do the tubal filtering. So that could be a workaround rather than smoothing it and then applying the filter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elizabeth, following um, hi, on yeah. that, hi. Um, I'm I'm wondering when I'm choosing those filters, like uh, what what are thing what are the things that I need to consider? Like, do I just try those filters, or like there is something that I can try first? Like, are there any um, criteria that I use? So yeah, unfortunately, there is not like one answer to everything because again, every every data set is different, um, etc. So normally what you would do is you would have different pipelines and, and compare them against each other. So this is one thing that we actually see here, like what happens if I do A and what happens to if I do B. Unfortunately, there's not like one do this and it works, um, but you really kind of need to optimize it for, for your data. And especially if you work, for example, with um, mouse data or in a different vascular bed as we do in the brain, you really need to kind of see how, how your system reacts or responds. Because for example, um, so if you're, if you're um, if you have a background, so for example, if you have a yolk, which is really highly autofluorescent, then you obviously need to, for example, first try and see to get rid of that, for example, with a rolling ball algorithm where you get rid of it. Um, so unfortunately, the answer is um, you have to test a lot of things and then compare them against each other and see what works. But often, just like you see here, it becomes very quickly clear that some things like this one and this one just merely don't work for the type of data. For, for, that we have in that case. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Okay, so for most of us, it should show this message now, message now saying macro finished. And if you can just say again, a, a yes um, or no in the chat and we know where we all are, that would be great. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, also out of space. Okay, are you running out of space on your computer, Miranda? I am, but I think it's kind of just about worked. <laughs> we'll see how far I get. <laughs> cool, thank you. Should, um, should the final output be only images? Um, in this case, yes. Okay, then, then everything is fine. Great, so uh, because at this step, we only did this enhancement. And after this, now we go into the segmentation where we actually get these first measurements. So just to, um, very quickly refresh you um, about the segmentation. What we're going to do now is we're going to binarize data. So we have now got this enhancement and now we go to actually say zero and one. So there's only vessel or non-vessel. In this case, again, we use auto thresholding, which is a um, histogram thresholding based approach. But again, there are different methods. So you can use texture, you can say, you can choose proximity, you can use um, color, size etc so there are different methods and again this is um if you establish a new pipeline something that i just have to try and see um what works or what doesn't work um uh, just a small question elizabeth mm -hmm. I was under, yeah i was on, under the assumption that we changed the name of the folder so that it doesn't get replaced because i suppose there was a tf folder that was going to be made and in my case, there's no TF folder at all. So where am I expecting the output to be? Saved? So the TF folder should maybe, be in... Maybe when you run the, the graphical interface, the first time I ran, I forgot to check the tubular segmentation. So I just ran and it did nothing. No, 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 no. It, it ran all of the six images. I was actually looking at them. And when it finishes the micro, it closes them all. So I suppose that it's safe yes, for me. Yes, so it, they, sh it, they should be saved now in the folder I2K data 512 by 512, because that's what we've chosen as an input folder. In the input folder, it should have made a new folder, which is called TF or tubular filtering. Um, well, that's not the which, case. <laughs> um, do you want to quickly share your screen? Because it must have saved them somewhere. Yes. Um, I can stop sharing. Fine. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. So yes. Uh, I changed the TF folder to TF1. Mm -hmm. And actually now uh, I was expecting actually a TF folder to appear and there's no TF folder. And of course, all the images in uh, image A actually uh, are closed now because the macro ended. OK. So, um, I will actually write or change this in um, in the code so you get the log file in the future um, because I think that's helpful. Um, but if you just click on your TF1 yes. folder, so I yeah, so okay. it's, that's kind of uh, one of the, the standard, yeah, okay. the, the okay, standard okay. issue. That's fine, that's all right. As long as it's there, it's great. Yeah, that's, um, that's perfect then. Okay, super. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, but in this case, it then actually ran them on the already enhanced ones. But it's fine. It's, it's just for today for the sake of it. But it, like I said, I will change it in the log file so you will see which input folder um, you chose and which output folder. So um, hopefully that will make it uh, more clear uh, in the future. Yeah. And the other thing, it actually processes all the T files within the folder I selected. So it also processes the, max, the maximum intensity directions. So in this case, the maximum intensity projections were PNG, so it shouldn't do it. Um, um, yeah, were they? Because I. So for the for the original ones, the yeah. TF ones probably. Oh no, they're also PNG, so they shouldn't have been processed. Um, what we select or what have at the moment that in the code, what it basically does, it opens the folder and it only selects TIFF files. But this obviously again can be changed. Um, but that's basically what I found is, is just the quickest thing to just select based on it's a TIFF just open. And you're it. right, they're PNG and they got processed and saved. Is that weird? Yeah, that is weird, but I will look into that. So, but, it, but yeah, it, any just, feedback yeah. like that is always good. So yeah. that just improves the code. So thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> PNG, TF, um, okay. 
I don't know if I'm the only one. Huh? Maybe everyone else also got the, the MIT special. I also got it. Yeah. Did you also run it on the TF folder, probably? <clears throat> uh, no, I I made sure that I did not, but I can try. I can hmm, okay. try to look at it. Okay, Jan also said it happened. Um, it should definitely not happen. Did you use Mac or uh, Windows, Windows or Windows? Windows in my case. Okay. Okay. Well, I have to look into that, but thanks. Um, Windows as well. Okay. Right. Shouldn't happen. Happened. Um. Right, and next step, I just share my screen again. Um, right, segmentation. So this is what we're going to do. So we binarize the images. Um, but also what we do is now basically select the region of interest. We're going to the same. OK, thank you. Um, and so, so we select this region of interest to make them more comparable. So basically, it, we often acquire data in like the different angles, etc. And in this case, what we do is we just have a two dimensional region of interest selection just for the sake of time. But you could also have a 3D region of interest selection if you have the time. However, when we actually do the acquisition, what we try is actually um, optimize the acquisition already. So we have comparability between um, the samples. I'm just trying to unclick this. Sorry. Um, so what we try and do is that if we go into um, or if we do the imaging, we try and align, align the fish dorsally. So we basically look straight onto them. And then we get when we go into the depth, we always have the same depth of acquisition. So we can start stop at this basal artery. So we define already that this is more comparable between them. But then also to compare them in X and Y, we use this region of interest section. Again, you can skip it or you can, for example, say you just want to look at the midbrain or you just want to look at the hindbrain. This is very uh, modular, but for today, we just look at the complete um, brain section. And again, because um, just to save you time and so you don't have to draw everything, um, I already drew them for you. And if you want, you can just have a look at them first. So. Um, this is in your I2K data folder, 512 by 512. There's um, a folder which is called Roy Sets. And if you would drag and drop it, it again would just open them. And what you see if you apply it to your different files is basically these are the outlines of, of your fish. I mean, again, they're just drawn very, very crudely, um, but this is how they would look like. So this fish you see is at an angle. Um, and this one is actually really small. And this one is a bit larger, but it's, it's rather straight. And so we can basically exclude the regions that we're not interested in. But again, you can zoom in on the midbrain or whatever you want to look at. And so um, before we run the next step, we can again close everything that we don't need just to not confuse everything. And then the next step would be to say again, run. Um, if you're comfortable, you can run all of them in one go. But I usually tend to always run one step after the other and just check my output. Um, before actually running the next step. Um, and so now we have to stun this tubule filtering and now we want to look into segmentation. And so to do this, um, we would say, yes, we want to perform it. And then we have this voice set existing. Um, if you wouldn't, it would give you different options of what to do. And similarly for the downsampling, we have already downsampled the data, but at this step, it would also ask you if you actually want to perform the downsampling, because what we found is that when we do this quantification, it's just significantly quicker to run it on downsampled data to, to analyze, for example, the branching points or the length. Um, and it also doesn't um, change the, the quantification outcomes if we run it on downsampled or um, large or like original data sizes. So in this case, we say uh, yes, yes, and then no downsampling. And if we say, OK, it will ask you again for the input folder, which is in this case now actually our tubular filtering data. So the TF, the ones that we have enhanced, is your input. So if you click on TF, what you should see is, is this um, line here so that you have I2K data and TF is your input folder. And if you select this, the next thing is going to ask you is where are your regions of interest? Because I've saved them for you, they will be in the I2K data folder. And one thing that you see here now is actually that um, Fiji says it is in this folder, but it actually attaches this TF. And this is probably what happened um, to Nicholas where, when he chose it before, because that's something that where Fiji just gets confused with where are we right now. Um, and so to get rid of that, you can just click um, upwards and then just select the folder again. 
and now you see that the TF is actually gone. So I have a question regarding mm -hmm. that, because since we got the maximum intensity projections also saved, should we delete them so that it doesn't confuse it because we only yeah, have- Yeah, you can delete it. Yeah, it would make sense if you, if you don't mind, just delete the maximum intensity projections. Yeah. Um, if things like that happen, I, I'm normally just either deleting or put it in a folder where I don't need it for now um, and just ignore it for the time being. <laughs> Okay, and when we have that, we can say select, and then it should open your um, regions of interest and then run the segmentation. In this case, um, what you should see here is that it runs everything automatically. What you see right now is the edge detection. We're gonna talk about this as well, but this is what we use to basically quantify the surface. So this runs um, quite quickly, but again, if you run it on larger data, this might take a little bit of time. Um, however, because it's such a threshold inverse approach, it, it is fairly quick and fairly nice. So um, you can change that. And again, um, you can also change the settings of the actual thresholding because obviously your data might be different. So you could say um, you set your, your own thresholding range. Um, Elizabeth, I had um, mm -hmm. I had an error message uh, popping up which said um, the system cannot find the file specified for the ROI zip. The ROI zip. I, I selected uh, the 512 by 512 folder. So do you I, have I, in I, your 512 by 512 folder? Do you have the ROI set? It should be there. Yes, yes, I do have, but I think. Um, what could be an issue is that this is not the zipped folder. It's, so maybe it's looking for the .zip uh, file extension. Yeah. Have you extracted it or? Would be, yeah. I, I think Do you want me might... to just, I can try and show it in the check function. So you... In the case of the ROIDs, you don't need to extract Fiji reads them as a zip and then yeah. uh, it extracts by itself. So for those of you who have um, an issue that it should be now in the chat function, so you can just download the, the zip file. Thank you. Okay. Annie, I've got a question about the ROI set. Yeah. I know you've done it for us, that's good, thank you. Um, but like in when I'm doing this with my own data, do I need a ROI for every sample or I can just apply one ROI to many pictures so there are different ways to doing it um so if you have so for example the treatment cases that we have they're very different so we have the healthy fish look very different to the to the um treated fish and that's why i opt for actually drawing it manually and we'll talk about later why this is the case but what you could do is actually run the segmentation without the roy set and then register the fish and then just draw one region of interest and apply this to all of them. Does that make sense? So if you'd do the registration first, like here, what you can so what you see here is that all these fish are in different orientations, etc. So you couldn't just apply one region of interest. But if you'd have them registered, you can just draw around one fish and then apply this to all of them. Okay, so when I'm using your uh, plugin, so in the zip, I can just put one royal. Is, is that what you mean? Um, you wouldn't, at this step, you wouldn't select it. What you would do is actually select it at the later step okay. um, for the actual quantification, which is, um, sorry, I've got so many windows now. Um, it, in it, this, it, okay. sorry, it's, it's just in this vascular quantification where you'd say, are the data registered, provide template ROI. So you would have one um, instead of many different ones. I mean, during the segmentation step, if if I got one big royal and can I apply that to all the images? So if they're comparable enough to them, then yes, then you don't have to select okay. it. Um, okay. But like, if you want to be really sure to or like do the vascular volume quantification, et cetera, properly, then I would probably tend to just 
draw it around individually. However, what you can also do is run the segmentation, then register them, and then do the quantification or the segmentation again um, to just get these output measurements. Cool. Thank you. So it's a bit repetitive and back and forth, but that's again like everyone has different needs to what they want to do with their data. So that's why I've tried to keep it modular and everyone can kind of just play around with it, um, what they want to do or have to do. Elizabeth, I have two questions at this moment, if uh, yes, please go ahead. I can. Um, first of all, what you call what you call uh, uh, the way you measure the vascular volume, the surface, uh, and the surface here is that you take, for example, for the volume, the area of each 2D section, and then you sum all of that and multiply it by the the big the. Uh, the distance between these uh, optical sections? That's so what we do is we quantify, so after the segmentation, yeah. you get the, basically the histogram is just black and white, right? Yeah, the binary image, yeah. So you just have the very one on the left and the one on the very right. And so what we do is we count the number of the black and the white ones and so whichever one is smaller is, is the vessels in our case, because like I said, the vessels are normally just 10% of the image. And then so um, what it does is takes all the counts of voxels and then multiply them by their size. So for each image, it's going to measure what the actual voxel size is. So even in case if you have your fish one acquired with a different size of fish three or a sample one to sample three, if they'd have a different X, Y and Z, you would still get the volume. And I'll show you um, in a second what data we will get, because actually in your TF folder, what you should have is now um, a, an Excel or like a file which says um, basketball results. And here it actually does give you the voxels, so the number of voxels and also the volume. So, it, um, so you could look at this and say, is it comparable or not? Because um, sometimes people do change acquisition from the first to the second sample. So they have suddenly different voxel sizes. So we consider that um, by showing both of them. And we then normally just look at the volume, which should be comparable between them. And for the um, edges, the same, we look at the voxels as well as the volume. And so what we tend to do for kind of um, publication purposes is actually then, so we measure all of them, but in case someone has changed from sample one to sample three, we actually go back to the volume and normalize this to one standard voxel size. Because again, if someone has changed the voxel properties here, the voxel number wouldn't be comparable between the fish. But, but that's one of the things I don't understand actually, because these uh, these surface measurements should not be in, in voxels. It should be in pixels because it's a two D it's a two D model uh, surface on top of the. Yes, I know what you mean. Um, so this is a so huge discussion. Information to the surface, if that is. Yeah. So there's this huge discussion if you have like what what do you actually define as a surface? And you are right. You should actually just take. The, the part of the voxel which is facing outwards. Exactly. However, because we work with voxels, it, they have different, you know, the edges and the faces, um, et cetera. It's not very clear what is actually defined as outside. So for example, if you'd have, if you'd look at your voxel and let's say, for example, this here is out or, or sits at the outside, do you just define this side as outside, or do you define this side and this side and this side as outside? So what do you really define as an outside? And so this discussion um, is unfortunately also not very easy to answer because at the moment there isn't anything very reliable to actually measure your surface um, if it's voxel based, because again, you have the stepping of different voxels. Um, I can actually try and just find um, an image which probably makes it a bit clearer because if I just jibber on like that, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, because you know, if, you're, if your vessels are filled, there are ways of actually telling what is the outside of, of that surface. I mean, of course it's modeled. Huh? It's, uh, I agree that it's a mathematical, a, a mathematical thing. It's not exactly the surface, but it's at least a 2D measurement and what I'm, a little bit confused about is that the, the measurement that you give out is a 3D measurement. So in, in 
in in a third uh, unit, no unit uh, for the third. That's why. Yes, yeah, so that's why we give both. We give the the voxel number as well as the volume. But I do agree. It is. And for, I mean, if you know something in Fiji which does it reliably, that would be great. However, we had the issue. That, that that's what I was coming to. Uh, do you know the MorphoLibG uh, plugin in Fiji? But yeah, does it do it reliably? Because that's the issue that we had for some of the data. It wasn't very uh, reliable with actually measuring the surface. Well, how, how do you measure reliability? Um, it's kind of model it with, for example, the perimeter of the vessels, no? So instead of, instead of using the edges, uh, instead of, of, because I see that you transform it into outlines, no? Yeah. Instead of doing that, when you apply the wrong measure of Fiji, you just get the perimeter of those field vessels. And then that perimeter, if you sum it through all of the, of, of the sections, it would kind of give you, well, the... That's what, so we've tried that um, based on like assuming that they are two, so we've tried three different methods. We've tried this tubular filter, uh, this, um, the method that I've showed with this edge detection. We've tried the MorphoLibJ and we've tried actually assuming that your vest is a cylinder and then like you say, you can approximate um, yeah. your surface. Um, unfortunately, that really didn't work too well. Um, because it basically just gave two large numbers and between the samples, there were huge differences. And so with this method that we use, we found it to be the, the, the standard deviation was way less between the samples. And when you basically look at them, it, it, makes, it, it makes more sense when you actually look at the data outcomes. It's very interesting what you're saying because I actually, I, I've actually never corrected because in my case, the data made kind of sense just by using that, that technique. But maybe uh, just not to keep everyone on this very, very uh, specific issue, uh, uh, we could maybe speak about that uh, yeah, please. after the training or something like that in another moment, because it's very interesting how you try to verify this. I would like to, more, uh, to know more about that. And just yeah. finally, the density, what you call density is the vessel volume with respect to the void, no, I suppose. Yeah. Because a lot of labs call density the number of vessels per, uh, 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 per void. Uh, and I actually thought at the beginning that the density was what you call density. And many labs call it differently. So I'm super confused about that. Do you know like what's the reason why this one is the density? So I think, so I think one issue in image analysis is that everyone is coming from a different field and everyone, like it be it physics, yes. be it biology, be it engineering, but also the actual kind of, what do we want to get out of it? And I think there's very little common language. And like you say, it even starts with what is density, um, different definitions, different fields. Um, in, in kind of maths, density you would define as how many objects are in a certain space. And this is basically what we do. However, like you say, there are many labs to say how many vessels are there in a certain space. Um, you can obviously measure this, um, but for us, we, we weren't interested into that. We used the branching points as basically a measure of, of, of voxel number or of vessel numbers. Um, but I do absolutely agree. I think one of the main issues is that this lack of common yeah, understanding. Yeah. Um, and so what we try and do is like define so in our work, define very clearly what we actually do. But obviously, again, then someone might completely differently understand what I say to what they understand. Um, so it's a very interesting that you bring that up. But I think it's just a question of terminology and background and how people are used to doing things. Well, that's fine. Then you 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 call it you call it the the vascular the vascularized volume. Let's say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Everyone clear so far, or have we lost someone now on all of this? Hi, sorry. I, I think my Zoom crashed during oh, no. the... Yeah, yeah. Um, but my, my micro uh, has finished. Um, so I, I think I missed some part of it. So what, what, what are we going to do next? Great. Um, we were basically just chatting about everything. Um, okay. Yes. Um, about like the certain definitions, um, et cetera. I can give you the heads up um, later as well. I'm just very conscious of the time. Um, 
Um, uh, just yeah? to just a quick thing. So the maximum projections are not of interest when we process them, right? We, I can just delete them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, you could run stuff on two D, but uh, we just it's... tend to run it on three D. We like three yeah. D more than two D. Um. Okay. Um. Where were we? Let me just change the slide. So we have now basically um, done the quantification. The next step, uh, the, the segmentation. And the next step that we want to do is actually um, quantification. You should see my screen now. Um, and so we have now basically segmented data and got the region of interest. If you want to look at your data and actually have a look at um, what we produce, what you will probably see is that they're still too large. Um, so they're not very nicely defined because again, I've downsampled them um, and I should have considered that, but I didn't. So my apologies. Um, and then basically the next step that we want to do is run the analysis. Um, the output folder will look like this so analysis and the input folder will be the thresholding. And so what we do in this step is, um, like I said, select the skeleton, which is um, based on this thinning approach. And so in Fiji, the um, 3D skeletonization plugin basically peels off the outer layers called simple point until there's only one center line left or one voxel y center line, which is shown in red. Um, I just make this larger to just quickly show you. If you're interested, there are different ways of actually identifying what your center line is. Um, so for example, the, the bone J and morpholib J, they both use um, basic mathematical components. So they try and place like a sphere inside the vessel to measure thickness. But in our case, we use iterative thinning because we found that this is, um, again, more reliable than, than this um, uh, more like component um, of, of placing this inside. And so all of this will run automatically. But basically what we'll do is, or what the, the plugin does is extract the skeleton and then measure the length, again, counting the number of, of, of voxels, um, like we just discussed with, with Nicholas, that might not be the 100% most accurate thing. However, um, because we work with voxel data, this is the most appropriate that we found to work. And this is also where we use the branching point or where we will measure the branching point using the Analyze uh, Skeleton plugin. And at this I'm point, gonna, I'm going to have to interrupt there again because I, I got lost on a small part. I'm so sorry about all the questions. Uh, when I binarize images and I don't know for the rest, I usually work with a background value of zero and a four one and a four one of two fifty five. Mm -hmm. And what I see here is that you do it the, the inverse way. Is there a reason why you do that? Uh, so you basically show it white on black instead of black on exactly, white. Exactly, exactly. It's just literally to, to for visualization and to, to make it more um, oh, okay. representative. So, so in imagery, you, you actually work with the white on top of the of, of, of the dark one. That's perfect. Yeah. You can change. So that's the thing. You can change it in my in in the code for the plugin. I've set it to show also like this. If you want to invert it, go for it. Um, it's this is literally it doesn't make a difference in the computation. It's just a, a difference in visualization because we find it easier to for contrast purpose of if we have it in a publication or, or like presentation to see a few black bits on white. It's easier than seeing a few white bits on a lot of black. It depends because in imagery, you can also change what you consider to be background and what you consider to be foreground. That's why I'm asking. That's what we do. So that's what we do in the plugin. So or in, the, in the macro, I set it to, to look like this. But again, if you feel more comfortable, okay. you can change it around. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's just so that I just don't need to set it up manually. That's the thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, so that's the thing. It should do everything automatically. Yeah. So you yeah, should yeah. see the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. Almost everything in Fiji is macro recordable, and then you can change everything on. Yes, no, absolutely. I just hadn't noticed that that it actually did that particular change also. 
Uh, yeah, so that is, is one of the teething issues we had at the start, because obviously if you run it always on the same machine, you don't need to change it, but then we run it on different machines, and then it suddenly was like, why does nothing work? Because yeah. of yeah. little things like this, so that's why we already in the macro at the start, we define that's how it's going to look like this. I don't need to pay any attention to that. Thank you. You're welcome. All of this is also in the code, so again, the code is, is freely accessible and you can change, etc. If you If you want to look through it um, I'm more than happy to have a conversation either afterwards or you can always drop me an email as well um, more than happy um, right and then also in this step like I said what it's going to do is, is measure this Euclidean distance map which is basically just a thickness measure um, like we just discussed before there are different ways to do it so you could place a sphere inside and measure the thickness you could uh, place like a radius measurement in terms of like you place it along your center line which would look more like this so that you have center line and then measures to the outside so there are various different ways but for computational purposes and because um, of like the implementation with Fiji what we opted for is the Euclidean distance map it is um, depending to you to who you talk they might argue that this is not the most accurate um however again we found that this works best for our data and i think that's always the thing you need to find what works with your data um because every data set is different especially if you look at mouse human fish, duck chicken they can all be very different so you need to find what works best and so we get this thickness measurement and again it will all do this automatically and then combine the skeleton with the euclidean distance map to actually measure the diameter okay um any questions at this point or uh, is everyone okay i have another one with respect to the euclidean distance measurement that i see there it would mm -hmm. appear to me that at least with the image it, with the images shown it's the radius that is the value of the middle of the line so you change that to kind of you transform it you multiply it by two what do you do and um, I just show it in the or in the on the graphs. I will actually just say um, radius. Okay. Um, but yes, good observation because that's the thing. I always tend to talk in in um, diameters, but it's actually the radius that we will get. Um, I'm just trying to open the macro again. I can just close it. All right. So. Um, if we run now the next step, we come to the quantification. So we now basically skip the registration as well as intrasample symmetry, which is something that we're interested in the brain. Um, and if you'd be interested, you can read all about these kind of steps again in the bio archive um, manuscript, but also in this workflow documentation on GitHub. So each one of them is, is literally described with step by step what you're going to do. Um, but now we just skip them and go to the vasculature quantification, where we measure the length, branching points, and diameter, which is actually radius. So I have to change that as well. Um, let me just write that down. <coughs> So um, we say, yes, we want to do this. We say, yes, the data are downsampled, but no, they're not registered. And um, this would be the case for you, Jan, if you want to do it where you just have one, one region of interest, this is where you could place your template um, ROI now. Um, and then if you say, okay, the input folder now is the thresholded data, so the segmented data. So we basically go folder by folder, basically into the deep what we want to do. And so, oh, I haven't shown you the edges. I will show you that afterwards if that's all right. And um, now you would just select your threshold at once. You probably don't have an analysis folder there yet because it will produce it, but I just overwrite mine. So what it should show is um, I took a data folder, TF and PH. And then if you click select, then it should do your quantification now. Again, this, the, the scaling didn't. Um, really work very nicely, but you can have a play with them later on. And also, I will now copy the link to the original data folder. So you can have large scale data as well if you want to look at them. So from this, we're going to get directly the the number of branches and the number of junctions and all of that. Mm -hmm. I was actually wondering, how did you go through the process of selecting a skeletonization algorithm? And also the way you select the parameters of the analysis of the skeleton? Because in my case, I tend to 
my, my analysis tends to overestimate the number of junctions. So I get like a lot of very small vessels that actually are not small vessels because the skeleton actually, uh, instead of doing a very nice vessel branch, it takes some of the branches like uh, differences in morphology and makes small branches out of that. And so it yes. reduces the size of a vessel. Do you have that too? So this is called spurious branching, which is something that everyone struggles with, unfortunately. And there are various ways to kind of address it. Unfortunately, again, there's no perfect answer. Um, one thing to do is you can, so, so these spurious branches mainly occur because you have like um, uneven surfaces. So you have little bumps and this is where you get these spurious branches. So what you can do is actually, after your segmentation, run, for example, an additional filter, like a Gaussian filter or um, a median filter, and then, um, but just binarize it again. You can also have an additional erosion or dilation, which just makes it a bit thicker and then a bit thinner again. Um, you can actually run a pruning circle, and I show you how to do that again um, as well on, on Fiji, but this pruning method, um, for example, considers the shortness, so it will remove very short branches. Or the last thing to do is actually remove branches under a certain size. Um, and I can show you how to do that as well. Um, and this is something that we've looked into because it was the most reliable. So we said everything that's under, let's like say two microns, you can remove that as well. As well. Um, but unfortunately, I find that in Fiji, that is not very straightforward way to do it. It's not 100% accurate. And the skeleton is, is probably really the most challenging thing that we find um, yeah. to get really clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it is not 100% accurate. Um, but I think, again, there's very little that is 100% accurate, especially when applying it to lots and lots of different um, data. Yeah, so, but I was, I, I was talking because uh, those are very, that, that is very good advice. And I think I've actually tried most of that. But what I wanted really to know is what is your process in the lab of, because these are very big images. You cannot verify the whole image. You, you know it. And so what are, for example, the steps that you go through to choose what are the parameters you're gonna, you're gonna select, like filtering small vessels, for example, how small. So for example, do you take, uh, how, how big an image do you take to actually perform the verification of, oh, this is working very nicely. This is not working very nicely. Yeah. So um, when you implement something first, I normally start working on like a quarter of an image, for example, just like to, to see if it works at all. There are certain steps which just don't work, which there are certain things which literally take 10 days to run. And that is not, so, so I exclude that because I'm like, you can't do that for a whole set of data. That would be 30 days. I don't have the time to do that. So time is obviously one thing. The second one is just have a quick visual assessment. So um, like I've shown you before, um, I tend to run a lot of different things. Um, and just by running literally loads of things, you can already visually exclude quite a lot. Um, and it is unfortunately a lot of, of just trial and testing I can show you um, one thing here so this is for example that what I'm working on at the moment trying literally um, everything that's available more or less um, and saying okay I start with an original data or like an original image and then I have a deconvolution I have I have no deconvolution I have a deconvolution I have processing I have no pre-processing I have let's say in this case six different thresholding methods and I've run all of this on just this first example image and then I can already exclude like this top panel I can say okay we have um, lots of protrusions, there's a lot of under segmentation, we don't get really meaningful information. And so you kind of narrow it down on, for example, four or five methods, which look reasonable. Um, and then you apply these four or five different methods on a complete data set. So instead of one image, you look at 10. And then you look again at them. And most of the time, it will become clear that some of them really don't work too well. Um, after this step, what they then tend to do is actually overlapping them visually. Again, for example, this and this, I would overlap in, in this two color image and go through it. I would then, for example, measure the volume because what we assume in these healthy samples is that the volume 
is very comparable between them. So I would not assume that fish A has, let's say, a volume of 10 and the next one has 1,000. That just doesn't make sense biologically. So you would have a narrow range of, of volume. And then once I, again, excluded some in the next step of this, what you then do is go into manual measurements. And I did a lot of them. <laughs> so you measure, for example, diameters. You measure how the diameter looks like in the original. How does it look in the enhanced? How does it look in the threshold? Are they the same? And does all of this correspond to your diameter measurement? So it's a lot of kind of validation and a lot of ma um, manual measurements, but that's what we find is the most that we can trust it basically um but it's a lot so it's a, yeah it is unfortunately a lot of like trial and error and seeing what works and what doesn't work but with this at least we can be confident that we've tried everything and that whatever we we found best to really work best in comparison to other things but obviously you can't try everything i mean there would be a hundred different thresholding methods and we just choose six in this case but that's already more than just applying one thing and saying oh that looks good Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Actually, nice to know that that everyone is going through that excruciating <laughs> process of. <laughs> yes, I mean the thing is also in presentations you always see the perfect final outcome kind of thing, but it is a lot of this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this yeah. might work, this doesn't, work. and, and that, so it is this this very long process of going through things. Um, but yeah, it's nice when you have, a, have an outcome to see that you can trust it, I think. Sure. Thank okay. you. Any other questions at the moment? Uh, maybe you said it already, but which, which language are you using for your code? Sorry, say again? Which language? So this is just a Fiji macro language. So okay. it's, it's literally... Okay. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. So it runs as <laughs> okay. Go, go, go on, go on. You go. You Sorry. can go. I just wait. Sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm just yeah, I just I just wanted to know the language. So you're just using uh, plugins that are already written on on Fiji, right? So most of them are yes, but for example, the um the the left right symmetry we've written that so um. So it's a kind of a mix of what's existing and what's not existing, because we're not fans of reinventing the wheel, um, because we want to answer true biological questions and not. Yeah. So, so I'm a biologist by training. So my main aim is to, to gain biological information. Um, and so if, if there is something that exists and it works for our data, then I will use that. But for example, for this left right symmetry, nothing existed and, and we were interested into that. So I would code it um, and it's in there. Um, for you to use if you want. And so for this one, you, you wrote it? Um, so yeah, so in the graphic user interface, there's this step, I think it's five or six, which is for this left-right symmetry. And this is um, what's written by us in, in there. Okay, and this, which which language is it? So it's again, or it's just in the macro. So it all runs in one as a macro because um, the idea was that if you write it as a plugin, we had some issues with calling, for example, other plugins into it. And that's why we had a macro to actually being able to access all the other things. And also yeah. for a box standard kind of normal biologist, um, even just installing a plugin can sometimes be a hurdle. And yeah, so yeah. I thought the easier I can make it with literally drag and drop and click a button, the, the you know, the easier it is the better it is um, and in terms of performance it didn't really make a difference and so that's why we then said okay we opt for the macro um, and also if people want to take sections it's probably easier for them to just take say certain sections and rewrite them themselves rather than when I do it as a plugin and then you know you need Eclipse or whatever to just even look at the code but in this way it's, it's I think more transparent for everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I can add something to it, uh, basically, Fiji was written with a macro language, and this macro language is based on Java. Yeah. So uh, what most professional developers on Fiji do is they just import all the functions that a macro has, and they sometimes write stuff in Java to do more complex, but those are some core programming stuff the more plugin based and some simple mathematical operations that we can do on macro, we can, we do 
it's easier to do on macro because of what Elizabeth said. It's much easier to copy and paste into a new script and to try things. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Question. I'm running the skeleton analysis and, and there's something come up, a uh, macro error saying that unrecognized command summarize skeleton. Is so you probably one? haven't installed a neuroanatomy one. Um, so that's what we did at the very start. Um, and this is, Sorry. no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But that's the kind of stuff, you know, like, um, oh good. We all run into stuff like that every day. Um, I can just quickly share the slide again for you to quickly do it now if you want to. But this is exactly where we need the, the neuroanatomy plugin that we've done or that we um, installed at the very start. Yeah, so why, what does the plugin do and why do we need it in this final step? So um, just very quickly, Jan, if you want to look at the screen, so if you do help update, and then if you show the details, it should show you the managing updates or manage update sites. And there you can do neuroanatomy. Then you can close and apply changes. And then you just need to restart Fiji. And then you can run it again. It actually summarizes the skeleton. Let me just do this here. So if you go to um, analyze and skeleton, Normally yeah. we have analyzed skeleton and this is which will quantify your branching points and um, your junctions, your length, your average branch length, etc. Et your summarized skeleton, it comes from the neuroanatomy plugin. And the neuroanatomy, this basically gives you the summary of the complete image. And so what you will get is the skeleton stats. So this shows you the overall total length, max product, da -da, so the same measurements but for the complete image. And yeah. this is why we use it at this case. But if you don't want this, um, so, so this is basically, to, so we can just copy and paste it. So this is the six different fish, all the measurements. But if we would want to process each individual fish afterwards, you would have the individual skeleton measurements in individual files. And this is where you could exclude, for example, based on the size again. But also, um, just referring back to the previous questions about the pruning of the skeleton, um, if you would have your threshold data, uh, your skeleton, let's just open this one. I oh, know, sorry. If you'd have this one, so this one is basically cleaned up, but if you wanted to have or like if you have a lot of like these spurious branches if you go to your um analyze skeleton in the actual um analysis of the skeleton you can set different pruning circle or, or cycles um and we find like shortest branch works best i have so because our data are binary i don't really know how these two would work on, on our data but i found that for example shortest branch pruning does reduce these short branches. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, just a comment on that. You should be very careful. So th this works very nice. The pruning works very nice when you have a very complete network. So for example, in, in the case of Elizabeth, it's absolutely amazing. She has such a complete <laughs> blood vessel network. But in my case, I have a lot of vessels. Since it's a section, even if it's, if it's thick, that are going to, uh, like from the screen to our face in direction. And so they're not connected between each other, all of them. So if you use the prune cycle method of the shortest branch, all vessels with one branch, even if they're true vessels, they're gonna get uh, uh, deleted from your analysis. Mm -hmm. Could you do like a, a measurement where you say you don't exclude them on the edges because well, you're you, you section them right and so they always kind of they, they will connect to to the to the edge of the image so you could maybe define everything that does connect to the edge of the image is well, actually a vessel well you could do that or uh, you could just use a size filter instead of like the, the other method you use now you also use a size filter 
yeah so this pruning does take the size filter so that's why i don't understand like if you if you have issues with that you wouldn't use size filter would you well, the thing is that the pruning does use a, a kind of size filter, but of course that it depends upon having many branches. But if you have one branch, the shortest branch is the branch itself. All oh, right, I get what you mean. Yeah, you could also, so, so there are methods, so in, in CT, what they tend to do as well is actually use a ratio of the vessel thickness to the length, because so spurious branches normally tend to be or, or like where you have these various branches normally tend to be just like these little dips on your vessel. Yeah, exactly. Right? And so what they do is basically measure the, the thickness at this region. And if it's, for example, twice the, the, the thickness of your average in the image, they would exclude that. So it's a length to, to width um, ratio, if that makes sense. And in your case, you would probably assume that most vessels are like, I don't know, let's say 20. Yeah. Um, and, and you could maybe have a play around with that. Yeah, that's actually that's that's actually a very nice idea indeed. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um the, the analysis is finished for everyone. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I think it has finished for most of us. Um, so what you should have is now this analysis folder. And in this folder, um, like I already showed, is that we have the skeletons. So this is 2D and we have skeletons down here in 3D. And you have um, these distance maps, which are the thickness. Again, they look just awful right now because um, wrong scale. Again, apologies for that. Um, and also we have this 1D um, or this one voxelized representation of thickness. And I think that this one is, is firstly visually quite nice, but also it actually does save the proper uh, the, the thicknesses. So if you want to look at a specific vessel a little bit more in detail, what you can do is just hover over it. And the value um, on top of the feature, as you can see here, so this value will actually change. Um, and so I'm just hovering, I'm trying to hover. Um, and so this should give you basically the thickness um, of them. So you could just examine, so this was an artery again, you can say how thick is it and how does it change over position? So I find that quite useful to do as well. Um, and so it will give you these images, but also it will give you the measurements. So in this diameter and, and length, it will give you the diameter and the length of the network. Again, this is um, in voxels. And then the skeleton stats is this summarize of, of the skeleton where you get these measurements of junctions and branching points, um, endpoints, triple points. Da, 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 da. One very important thing um, in Fiji is actually that because we work on a voxel based thing, there can be um, obviously difficulties. And I'm just um, trying to see if I've got this somewhere open. Um, no, I don't. Never mind. Uh, but basically, it defines a voc or a branching point as something that has three neighbors. And if you look at a voxel, that's the case for quite a few of them. So it actually tends to overestimate the branching point. So this is something to be very, very careful about. And um, also, what we find is actually that the junctions are better than the branches. And I'm not quite sure what actually uh, the the Sorry, the junctions are, are more reliable than um, the number of branches because um, it gives us more robust states. But this branch is actually, again, a bias due to this probably spurious branches. So, so reading out this, I'm, I'm not always 100% sure what really makes sense. But we here use the, the junctions to measure the number of branching points. And that number of branching points is extrapolated to the number of vessels that we have? Um, you could do, but we actually don't do it at the moment. Um, so the, the future, hopefully, it will be to being able to extract individual vessels. However, it is very challenging because there's kind of no standard template, no standard atlas or anything for, for the seven fish brain vessels in, in, in like computational terms. Um, and so this is something that we'd like to do in the future. But um, what have you tried actually to do that single vessel uh, segmentation? It's a very sore point. Um, so um, we, 
so, so after the registration, what we've tried and the, or what we've done is we try to manually annotate some of the vessels and then apply it to, to different fish, et cetera. And this kind of partially works for, for standard larger vessels, but it's not very applicable to, to do it in large scale. And also it's very prone to shift variation. Um, and so kind of, for example, what the mouse field and what human fields do is actually they use the brain um, the brain regions to class or, or cluster regions of vessels and then say this is vessel x vessel da, da, da. but again this is we don't have this in fish at the moment and especially because fish that their brain develops very largely over, or, um, over time and also during treatment so the issue would be that for each single treatment or each different age you would need a standard atlas or a standard annotation and this makes it very, very challenging. Um, if you just work on one type of data, it's, it's probably fine to do some manual annotation and it's okay to just sit down one weekend and just, you know, go through everything. But if you work on very diverse data, it's unfortunately not very straightforward to say um, this is how it works. But maybe in the future, if we have time, um, we can work on that. Okay. Because I suppose that the what what you would like, like the gold standard of what you you're looking for, is to have vessels that are separated by um, each other through their junctions or through their branching points, and that then you can automatically analyze them as a population. No. Yes, um, but that, like you say, depends highly on their connectivity. And connectivity is not always given. So if you have a break in your data, um, that just makes it basically non-working. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So there are different ways, again, to do it. But I think comp the, the thing is also like in theory, it all works great. But then actually when you sit down and try and do it, you will see that there are suddenly loads and loads of issues. And it's just not that straightforward. OK. Um, any other questions right now? No? OK. Um, what I would suggest is maybe have another like five minute break, stretch legs, get another coffee. And then once we come back, because we've run through it, we can actually discuss again, what are the data that we got? Why is it important? And then start really discussion about how can you use what you've learned today on your own data? Are there any questions that you have? Um, do you want to discuss anything a little bit more specific, etc.? And kind of really tailor it now towards you guys rather than me um lecturing to you if that's okay um so if everyone is fine with that just five minute breaks get a tea get something to eat stretch the legs and then we'll just uh, meet in another five minutes if that's okay okay see you in the five minutes so um what you see in the screen is basically a whiteboard um, and we can just basically start making notes for like a discussion which we have afterwards once we've kind of discussed now what we've, what we've done and what we see um, and just kind of start the discussion also about if someone else wants to discuss, for example, like cheat a little bit more in detail or if they have specific questions to their own projects, etc. And you can basically make notes by hovering over your screen and that what you will see is like the screen section um, where it says like Elizabeth is, is sharing her screen and then you have options and then you can either it says annotate or comment and you can then write comments onto this whiteboard and we will use that. Um, so this anonymous kind of bullet points and thoughts to then start off the discussion. So if you, each one of you just wants to, to type one or two things, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So I don't understand very well the, the, the process of annotating because you say that we can actually make anonymous notes, but the other way to do it is to just type it. I, how you can we... either type in the chat or on the, so if you hover over your screen, you should see, you seeing the, the screen of Elizabeth Kugler. And then if you go to options, you can say comment or annotate. It depends on the version that you use. And then you see um, a, like a panel, which has a mouse text drawing, etc. And so you could, for example, make a text and say, like cheat or what? And so, so we can write on the screen all together. And just take these notes just for for prompting a discussion. Yes, I see this. Thank you. <clears throat> so 
I just delete the one that I've done because it just said like. Um, Sorry, I'm being very dumb here. I still cannot find that. No, Can it's great. I mean, again? yes, on the so if you hover over your screen, you should see like a green bit on the top or the bottom of your screen, right? So it's, yes. you're looking at the screen of Elizabeth Kugler and then it says options to mm -hmm. the right of it. And if you click there, the third thing down should say comment or annotate. Oh no, you, you're requesting remote control. I don't, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but basically underneath sorry. that, underneath um, requesting remote control is comment. Oh, I got it. Yeah, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, if that's the only thing we all learn here today, then that, that is more than enough how to use Zoom. <laughs> Similarity, great. So I just make notes on that so we can start the discussion with this as well. Thank you for the feedback. Yes, in any case, Elizabeth, it's a very nice training and thank you so much for making thank it so interactive and, and so detailed. Thank you. I, I hope it's really um, useful because um, like I said, I'm a biologist and so I'm really like, I really want people to feel comfortable with their own data. So um, I appreciate it. If it was useful to people and they have learned something, that's the main thing really. Thank you. Okay, most of us are back. If if um, I just give you one more minute just to make comments, um, that is great. Um, Quantify three D network. That probably needs um, clarification because I'm not one hundred percent sure what that means. Oh, we just if, if the people who wrote the things on, on the bottom right corner, just move them a little bit apart so I can actually read them, that would be great. Great, thank you everyone. <clears throat> okay, I'll just give you like 20 seconds and then um, we can move on from that. Great, fantastic. So I would stop that now, if that's all right. Um, okay, that's all. Thank you, everyone. Great. So, First thing is, um, we'll, we'll just briefly talk about um, the things that we actually quantified and what, what kind of we expect as the outcome and what, why it's needed. And then I made notes now on all the comments. So thank you everyone for actually making notes, et cetera. And also thank you for positive feedback. That's always much appreciated. Um, and so I will just briefly share my screen again and we can actually talk about what we would expect when we plot the data. If you want, you can plot the outcomes like the, the, the data that we have produced. But just for like the time, um, I actually 
aren't we actually doing doing? So, sorry, I just get away to know it goes away. So, um, looking at the quantification outcomes, and we just here look at like um, six different um, things that we have analyzed when we look at the controls as well as the fish without blood flow. We would assume that, for example, the vasta volume is decreased in these fish because also by, already by looking at them, we see that they have less vessels and, and they, they clearly look thinner. We also would assume that the surface is reduced due to this kind of reduction of vessels. And um, what we actually see is that density is not reduced. And this is um, kind of referring back to the discussion before, which is actually quite interesting, that we measure this density based on the reach of interest or, or this, this volume of interest that we have defined. Um, in this case, the density is actually not reduced because the head of the fish is actually smaller. So if you just look at these um, fish without blood flow against the ones with blood flow, you see that their heads are actually far, far smaller. So what you could do in this case is actually do a normalization and normalize this brain size back to the uninjected controls. If we do this, we actually then would see that the density in these fish is being reduced. Um, but for, for kind of this, this um, manuscript, we have not normalized it. But this is one step that you can also do, thinking about normalization, how to then justify your data and, and, and look at them in, in the actual graphs and, and the numbers that um, you get. Should yeah. we normalize the data to our to our lowest size that we find or to the biggest size we we find? So for example, in this case. So, um, normalization is always a huge point of discussion. I'm not a huge fan of it, um, but I would always suggest to do it to your healthy control. So the one that you would assume to be the true biology, so to speak. Yeah. But if you have done a treatment, this is interfering with the true biology. And so this is why I would say in this case, you just normalize it to your um, controls. Okay. Um, and then I would do the same. There, Elizabeth, because I, understand, I, I actually understand well why you would like to normalize it to your control, but the vascular volume, for example, but why the vascular density? Because precisely the idea of that measurement is to give you kind of, of the idea of what is a fraction vessels occupying space and why would you want to, to normalize that to your control? So you could normalize any of them to, to your controls, um, obviously. Um, however, so, so I just picked this as an example because this is the only measurement which is not significantly different. And this is only the case because they have this smaller brain size. Because we know in these fish that they don't have blood flow and so their brain never expands properly. Um, but again, you could like you say, normalize the volume. You could normalize whatever you want to, but I, so like I said, I'm personally not a huge fan of normalization because I always, I find it very tricky to define where is this point of it's, it's over normalized and you know, you kind of design data or you, you massage your data to be what you want to see. So what I normally tend to do is plot everything like we've done here. So just plot all of this and then let the data inform me to what we actually do see. Sure. But like you are correct, we could normalize the volume, we could normalize the other ones, um, but I personally am not a fan of it. I think normalization it's only best for representation. So when showing something in a paper, just because it's easier to interpret one against everything, that's my view on normalization. But yeah, no, I agree. I think it's it's mainly data representation, but obviously, if you have um, a difference like the brain size, it would make sense to normalize them. But again, it's always like a question of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I would agree. I, I would agree with that comment, uh, with the exception that I think that since Elizabeth <laughs> with development and there's not a lot of variability between these fish because it's a developmental study, I think it makes sense to actually not normalize the data as much as you can because the variability is low. But when you work with uh, adult uh, animals, there's huge variability sometimes between, between each of the animals. So normalization comes in very handy if you actually want to detect whatever you want to detect. But then you normalize within the sample group, which is different to normalize between treatment groups, right? So 
that's Absolutely. a whole other kind of question. So, so this is also something that I find very um, challenging. I mean, we were very fortunate because we can achieve this with this region of interest to make sure we can compare them as much as possible. But obviously, there are there are data where you can't just draw a region of interest, and so you sometimes have like significantly more or less. And so you need to find a way to to normalize or being able to compare them. So I agree. It's a very interesting discussion, Elizabeth. Do you know if there are actually uh, some some features where the field agrees, like into how to normalize it, how to present it? Um, again, I think it highly depends on the background um, of scientists, if they are biologists or statisticians or um, et cetera. It also depends on if you work in cell culture or in fish or in mice. Um, everyone defines even a, 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 a sample as something different. So, for example, in fish, we have this huge discussion that if you have 10 fish in one dish, this should be an N of one in theory. If you have 10 fish in 10 different dish, this should be an N of 10. So it starts even there to say, how do you define an appropriate end number? How do you average within groups? How and, and the issue is, I think, at least as far as I know, there isn't a standard approach to doing it. And, and um, in our lab, we have a lot of discussion about how to do it best. And I think the best thing that you can do is, is just randomize and automate as much as you can. But there is a limit and there is like a human bias at some point. It's even like just withdrawing this region of interest, you could be biased, right? So you can try and make it perfect, but I think there's just no perfect and you just have to acknowledge that there are certain limitations. Right. One more question about the output. Mm -hmm. um, the vascular volume, for example, where do you get that from? Do you calculate it in the end from what you get from the skeleton stats or so the volume at the point the volume is quantified after the thresholding so it's in the folder tf vascular results and when you start the user interface it will show you for example here segmentation it says vascular volume surface and density and then for the quantification here quantifies the length branching points and diameter um, again, if you're interested in more of these steps, the PDF on the GitHub gives you way more information. Um, same with the manuscript gives you way more information. But again, if someone over here is interested, I'm happy to talk um, through all of that um, later, another time, um, whenever. But this is the point where we quantify the volume and the surface and the density. Brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Um, and then um, just looking at these data as well, just quickly. Um, Branching points uh, is one of the things that we measure the network length and the average radius. Um, so this is also where, and I'll say radius instead of diameter, because um, as we pointed out previously, we actually quantify the radius, not the diameter itself. So the diameter would just be twice the, the thickness, basically. Right. Are there any questions on this, or do you want to kind of start the the other discussion now? I could start with the end. I'm fine with that. I mean, uh, of course, if if you're not planning also on explaining us how you did these amazing measurements of complexity and similarness of your paper, I'm actually very interested in that. Um, I can show you. So that was one of the questions. Um, so we can dive into that. I just open the thing. It's with the same macro, I suppose. Um, no. <laughs> the similarity, yes, is in the registration. The complexity is not. But I'm going to show you uh, what we've done. I just need to find the right version of the manuscript. Um, Brilliant. Thank you. Can you just remind us what the complexity and similarity are? Complexity is the number of nodes one node is attached to in in a bridge, something like that. And um, I will show you in a second. Let me just find okay. it. No worries. Cool. Thank you. I was expecting the same, but I suppose that she's gonna she's gonna say it whenever the image uh, is there. No? 
Yeah, so we're so right now today we're not running through it because of time, but um, I will show you how to do it. Um, right, let me just think. Oh, we have everything. <clears throat> The thing is, I'm multitasking on different screens just to manage, manage everything, but then there's so many windows that I confuse myself. So, <laughs> apologies. Right. Um, so, similarity measurement. Um, so, so, there are two measures that we haven't spoken about similarity and complexity. Um, I think similarity is, is less interesting to most people rather than complexity but it's kind of uh, um, still both very important and, and might be useful to you guys and so basically similarity is what we want to measure when we have unregistered fish versus basically the registration so how can we basically compare if our registration work and how did we make it similar firstly we see visually that there is a lot of overlap but also kind of we want to do it computationally the challenge is that again with most of these things there is nothing on, on zebrafish. There is, is very little in the literature in general in biomedical image analysis. Most of this knowledge all comes from the medical field, especially from brain, um, MRI and CT imaging in humans. So everything that we kind of apply comes from very different fields, very different image acquisition methods. Um, and so what we try to do is basically have a, a proof of principle. We can actually register our fish and we can actually measure um, structures of similarity and variability. So one thing was actually perform this registration. And again, the details are in the manuscript, but in this case, we use an automatic registration, which just tries to overlap the fish and bring them into one spatial coordinate system. When you, once you have this overlap, once, what you can do is, is basically average the images against each other. Again, the details are in the manuscript, but if you average them, it should basically take the mean of the overlap of the samples. And so you get different intensities based on the amount of overlap between fish. So intensity means overlap in this case. And what you can do is apply a lookup table, such as here where we see yellow are, are regions of tight similarity and blue are the regions which are more dissimilar. And so once we, or we, when we do this, um, for example, at different ages, what we see is that certain key vessels um, in the brain are actually really highly similar between samples and they're highly similar over time. But this is just a visual thing. And so what we want to do is actually quantitatively do it. And so what we use to measure similarity is called a dice coefficient. And this basically is just a measurement of overlap and there are like different methods to measure overlap. Um, Elizabeth, um, if I may just uh, yeah. interrupt you. So, um, how um, how does it uh, compare to if you have manual landmarks? You know, so so like for example, this is an automatic registration, but um, how would it be if you were to sort of, as you were mentioning, you know, have some you know visible landmarks with which you can really be sure that this uh, registration is sort of uh, going well? You know, so does, yeah. do you have that in coefficients for manual registration as well? Um, I will show you in a second. I just need to write, find the right figure. Sorry. Um, so regarding to that question, um, automatic versus manual registration. So um, again, you can use different methods and you can, there, there are different registration methods. So we can focus on these two here, but basically we have, so this is just showing unregistered fish from two to five days. And this is, so they're color coded by depth. So everything that's more closer to us is white and everything that's further away is, is purple. And um, down here we have landmark based registration. I can talk to you in a minute about how I actually identified the landmarks. And this is the overlap after automatic registration. And so what we've done with these fish is actually then quantify the dice coefficient. And I can zoom in a bit more. Um, the dice coefficient in the fish which are unregistered, then against landmark based registration, and then against automatic registration. So the three different colors show the three different um, sets, so to speak. And then we go from two days to three days to four days and to five days. Um, and so again, it has never been done before, so it's very difficult to find a reference point. But what we found is just by looking at this, that actually automatic registration has a higher dice coefficient. And also when we visually compared it, such as for example here, you see that there's more overlap. So you see, for example, here, there's a little bit of, of this vessel shifted to the side. So this 
and this is letting the, so the registration was better in terms of outcomes. However, the caveat with like automatic registration is obviously is automatic. So you need to check it at the end because sometimes it can just be that um, instead of being nicely registered, one fish is completely turned upside down or completely to the side. So this is kind of the, the caveat, whatever you do, you kind of want to just visually check that it worked. Um, but so applying this, this similarity measure basically um, allows us them to, to compare how they look. Um, and then what we use this for as well is then actually to see, um, but to apply it to the fish without blood flow. So this is basically where we look at these average maps in, in maximum intensity projections. So this is where it's useful. So if you look at purple, these are the regions which are highly similar and yellow are the regions which are more dissimilar. And this is the, the uninjected controls which we looked at, then we have a control morpholino and then we have fish which have no blood flow. And just by looking at this, what you see is that these fish without blood flow have a lack of these standard vessels in the midbrain, especially. So here we see these very nice vessels um, outlining the brain and all of them are lacking in the fish without blood flow. And if we quantify the dice coefficient, so this is the unregistered in injective controls, and then we perform the registration, and we see that the registration works, but actually that these fish without blood flow have a lower similarity to the uninjected controls. Does that make sense, or did that now confuse everyone? Yeah. Uh, oh, I think. Um, yeah. Sorry, go, go on. Ah. No, um, so I, I was wondering how feasible it would be. I mean, of course, this would be landmark dependent, right? I mean, uh, um, and also how, how feasible it would be, for example, if you were to have, instead of a vascular network, a sparsely labeled neural network, you know, for example, yeah, I mean, some sort of a sparse labeling technique and we want to quantify the, exactly the same things, but more in the neuronal perspective, like synaptic branching and I don't know, all these different kinds of uh, morphological features of, um, of neural networks. So there also, um, do you think such kind of um, uh, automatic uh, registration and then validation of these things using such coefficients would be still a very valid way to do? Go about I, I, think, I think for sparse labeling, um, I probably wouldn't do it. So, so, my th so, so you work with fish, right, as well? So yes. you could, so you could use like a second transgenic to, to register the brains and then see if, for example, the neurons are like as far as astrocytes or whatever you look at are distributed differently. You can do that. And there for the brain, there's significantly more work in fish than actually for the vasculature. So there are different methods to do the registration. So you could look, for example, how the positioning changes, et cetera. But if you just want to look at individual, let's say astrocytes and, and how they branch, et cetera, I would think that you actually have a very small image as well. So you zoom in far, far more. So you don't look at the complete brain. Um, and then it probably doesn't make sense to, to register individual astrocytes, I would assume. But please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, yeah, makes, makes total sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Not anymore for the similarity, but I suppose that now you're going to explain also the complexity feature now. Yes, I just very quickly um, jump to the landmarks just to quickly show that. Because um, what we did was to actually identify landmarks. We actually did a lot of like manual measurements. And I think that's also something that so, so if you work in a field where there isn't really anything established, you kind of need to be aware that you need to spend a lot of time on just manual measurements, just testing, um, examining, and really not doing things, but actually understanding things. And so, um, so one thing that we did is like doing a lot of manual measurements to see how comparable the fish were in the first place, because we didn't know if, if they were similar enough to do registration at all in the first place and so you can do like manual measurements just like the size the diff or the distance etc the angles to see if there is initial similarity or not and how this changes over time and then i just need to find the um um the right um figure so we basically identified um three, uh, no, 12 landmarks, sorry, my apologies, um, which are shown here, where we found these ones 
are actually the most similar between our fish. So these are just specific sets or specific points within the vasculature. But again, this is different to each fish, etc. But we basically derive these just using um, the, the manual measurements. Um, but yeah, again, kind of to start off, you, you really just need to spend a lot of time on understanding all of this or like understanding the data. Um, and then the complexity. Again, um, so this is unpublished. So oh, jumping. So, so you do it with shallow analysis. Yes. So there are different ways to assess your, your networking or your, your, your branching. The two most famous ones are called Shoal and, Stra and Strala. I just um, put that in the chat as well. So um, this is what they're called, Shoal and Strala. And so they have different assumptions. Both of them kind of come from, so, so one of them comes from neurology and the other one comes from, um, I think, riverbeds um, analysis. And so the first one is, is the Shoal analysis, which I'm showing here. And in this one, basically the way it works is that you place a center point and we place the center point inside the brain. Um, and so this works on the 2D skeletons. And we place an interest point here at this position, which we again know is then each samples because it is alongside this or after this um, basilar artery where it branches off. And then about five microns away from the branching, we set our center point. So again, we know it is comparable between the fish, even if they have been treated um, or, or anything. And so what we can do is, is basically pl place a center point. And then what this analysis does is basically draw circles around this center point, And it measures the numbers of intersections along these spheres or shells, what they're called. And it then counts just the numbers of intersections. And so what you get is basically the number of intersections, but also the distance of intersections. And if you look at... Um, this kind of graph here, what you would see is basically there's a number of intersections, and this is the distance from the center. And in this case, apologies for just jumping, to actually do it in Fiji, um, you can open, um, sorry, if you go to your data and then um, just all the way into TF and to TH folder and then into analysis where we have the skeleton. And if you just check and drop it, um, I'm not sure if Shoal is actually um, a standard. Sorry, a standard yeah, yeah, thing. A okay, then it should be an analyze. Um, mm -hmm. Is it Shoal analysis? I haven't done this in ages. I'm very sorry. Hello. Um, I'm sorry, it doesn't bring anything up right now. Um, I can't remember right now. Do you have it on yours, Nicholas? That's a weird thing. I mean, some days ago I had it and now it's not there. <laughs> Yeah, because I thought it was just there, but... It should be in, in Analyze, and I don't see it anymore. Could it be that they took it out? Of Most the, likely. Of the basic... Uh, oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Do you have it, Jose? Or... No, I don't. I don't have it. But maybe an older version of Fiji, maybe something like no. months ago. It might have it, but I also keep updating mine constantly. Yeah, yeah. because it, it could be, for example, in the neuroanatomy plugin too, no? Yeah. No, I it, thought it was just an analyzed shawl. Yeah, so yeah. It, it seems to be gone. Now. Um, hmm. Okay, we'll find it. I will send the details to you later. But basically, it should come up with an interface where it just asks you to place your region of interest, where you just select the, the point tool and place it. And then it will ask you about like how far your spheres that should go. Mm -hmm. But you should be able to show us. It's in the, neuro, in the neuroanatomy uh, plugin. 
Just go to the plugin. I just found it. Oh, so they've just moved it. Yeah, I think they moved it, but it's kind of not very intelligent because now it means that you need to install mm -hmm. a new plugin and it's not. Constant. Okay, that's new. Um, yeah. Okay, so guys, if you want, you can go to plugins, neuroanatomy, and shawl analysis. I'm actually yeah, was... wondering before you proceed, Elizabeth, is there a particular reason why you decided to do the shawl analysis in 2D? Because I know that in the, in the neural field, they, for example, do something that they call, I think, I, I'm not a, neuro, a, a neuroscientist, so a, anyone that is, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have these neural tracing uh, plugins that actually do shawl analysis on 3D. Yes. Um, so we also have that in the SMT, so the simple neuro tracer, um, in 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 Fiji. However, um, so what we found is that actually this analysis works the same if you do it in two D or three D, but it's just way quicker to do in in two D. That's what we found, and that's why we just do it in two D. But if you have subtle differences, then it's always worth doing it in three D. Yeah, especially if you like um, work on on. Um, sparse labeling or neurons that it makes sense to actually work it on 3D. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, once you have selected this and then you can set to center and then um, they have actually changed that. Um, so you can here change the radius, which is basically how far do you want to extend to the side and how large your, your image are. The step size is basically the number of 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 um, shell or like the distance between the shells. So if I just increase that, you will see that the dif like there will be less shells, if that makes sense. So you just get less numbers. Um, we just take like three hundred or so because most of our images are like six hundred by six hundred, so that would be the radius. Um, and then the step size is is basically we set it to about five, but you can play around with that and, and just make sense. And then if you just say, um, okay, then it should just plot everything, which just doesn't do it at the moment. Okay, I'm afraid it doesn't um, just plot. I will have to look into that new version or like that new thing. Um, but you will basically just get a long list of intersections and then you can plot them in like these various ways. So these are just different representations of the same thing. Um, where we plotted as a line graph or as a bar graph, um, etc. Um, Jotin just said he's. Way to... I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Sorry, um, Jotin just said he he's read something about this on BioArchive. Let's just open the link and have a look at this. Automated morphometric analysis reveals plasticity induced, persistently used by chronic antidepressant treatments. Um, in hippocampal astrocytes. Okay, so that might be interesting. I will read that later. Thank you. Um, so that deals with more more morphometry analysis. Can't speak. Um, right. So this is one way to do it. But then also the other step would actually be called um, Strala analysis, and this works differently. So basically, what this tries to do is you try and find a start point, and then it goes along your skeleton. And whatever you have a branch point, it, it it counts the number. So so this would be one, and then two, and then the more branches you have, the more the more levels basically you get. So this would be one method. Um, it works great on vascular trees such as the liver, the leg, um, the human brain, all good. But what we found the issue is in in silverfish brain that this is a closed vascular system, so you don't have actual true endpoints, if that makes sense. And so you can't define reliably where basically, where's the next step. So we, we've spent quite a lot of time thinking about how to define it. Um, but again, we we found this complexity and actually the shawl more reliable because we have this enclosed system. But again, it's probably a question of trying both, uh, also in 2D and 3D, and then seeing what works and, and what makes sense because sometimes if you do your thing in 2d and in 3d 
it, it doesn't really add too much to, for example, us to show analysis work in, in 2D as well as in 3D, but it was a question of time. And so we said, okay, just 2D is fine. Okay. Um, there was yeah. a maximum projection of the of the final skeleton, right? The, yes. That, that skeleton image. So if we have like in Z, mm -hmm. two vessels forming, mm -hmm. does, can we catch that on the maximum projection or not? So if we have a vessel, then they separate, but downwards. We don't see on the X and Y, we only see on Z. Maybe this downwards, we can identify mm -hmm. something in the X axis. And does and any branching point count them as separate vessels or not? So at the branching points, yes, because that works in 3D. The complexity, um, no. So if you would have the case that if, if your vessels run in parallel for a long time, they would obviously overlap on top of each other in the projection. But as soon as they go outwards, then you see them. So that's one of the things of like the 2D versus 3D um, difference. And that's again something that you kind of want to test with your data and see what makes sense. But that's that's one of the things, obviously, why you want to work in 3D if you can, because you don't see the structures in, in Z in, if you have a maximum intensity projection. Okay. Um, any questions on this, or are we okay? No, I think it's. It's clear, thank you. Great, so we discussed similarity and complexity. Um, um, I just read through my notes. Um, so one question was to actually look at intrasample symmetry and because of time, I'm not going to go um, th going to, to go through all of it, um, but I can, briefly show you the, the manuscript and how to do it and um, basically yourself. Again, all the individual steps and it's really kind of a, an, an idiot guide for myself more than anything, um, are described in the workflow. And I'm just opening this up. Um, So left-right symmetry, and um, you have different options to actually look into this. Um, one way I've done it is actually that you can draw like a line reach of interest along your anterior to posterior axis. Again, we're very fortunate in fish that you have a very nice separation between the left and the right brain hemisphere, just because of the, how the data look like. Um, so one way is to actually draw manually a line of reach of interest on your different fish, or you just draw one after the registration and apply it. Um, and then with, with this one, which is, I think, step five or six in the workflow. So th all this is, again, in this document one. It will literally give you, why do we do it? What do you need to create? Da, 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 da. And then it will actually rotate the complete image um, to be aligned in the y-axis instead of being at this angle, it will be straight. And then it will um, split the two images and actually transform the right brain hemisphere basically on the left one. So it flips it over. And then you can compare them visually, but also quantitatively, where we again use the dice coefficient to measure how much they overlap. Um, and again, I don't really want to go into too much detail, but with the workflow, you can use this, but you can also um, measure for example, the mid versus hindbrain, um, which I'm just trying to find. Um, sorry. But it's a step where we need to draw the line, right? Um, so if you want to do this um, before registration, then you need to draw it per fish, yes. If you apply it after registration, then you can apply it with one. one. Yeah, basically one line for all yeah. of them, yeah. Yeah, um, but you also have the other option if you don't actually want to map them. So if you don't want to actually um, so, so flip them over, as you can see here, you can also just measure, for example, the differences by just having a different uh, region of interest selection. So before we draw, drew around the whole brain, 
but you can also just change it to look at like left so we just have it here as an example left brain versus right brain full brain versus mid brain you can look at just this region here so this all depends on how, where you draw your region of interest and again if you do it after registration you can just draw one and then it will apply to all of them does that make sense yes is this at this point have we lost people or is anyone lost or is everything still more or less clear i think it's super clear elizabeth thank you <laughs> um if i can have a question about the mounting the sample on the light sheet mm -hmm. how do you make sure that this is more a naive question for me because i don't work with zebrafish for a long time but how how do you tell when acquiring what is the left what is the right what is what sort of standard do you go through um so i think imaging is a lot of practice and it's um especially with light sheet we're very fortunate that we do have this 360 degree rotation and setup that we have so we use so now light sheet microscope what we have is we um our fish is embedded in an agaros block and it's basically in the in the glass capillary there are different options to do this but we have um the, the fish in this agarose block in the glass capillary and then it sets into the into this chamber and so what we can do is actually rotate the complete agarose block with the fish so we have a free 360 degree rotation and so that is obviously allowing us to access way more angles than we would do for example with a confocal where you just embed it flat and then you have to look at this position so we're very fortunate with this um, in terms of how do you define um, I think it's a lot of practice and um, I can just show you just very briefly how, how I normally do it. Um, I mean, I haven't been on the light sheet myself now for like eight months. So, but I guess that's how it is, right? Um, so when I set up the microscope, the first thing is, is basically trying to position the fish more or less in the center. So uh, this is actually quite far to, to the edge. I would normally try to have it a little bit more to the left. So I try to have the image as small as possible, but as large as needed. So no unnecessary pixels, but all the necessary information that I need. And so um, this would probably normally be a little bit more to the center if possible, but that's um, how it is. And then once I've, I've got my sample in, I go basically through the stack first thing and then see if we are off or not. And then the great thing again in fish is that we have this really high symmetry. So for example, this vessel on the left is the same one as it is on the right. And your center line is basically this vascular artery. So the vessels guide you very much, which is great. And so you can then also look here in the eye, we have this vessel and it starts here as well. So we have them quite nicely aligned, same with this on the left and same with this on the right. And so if you then go through the sample, you can also look at more dorsal regions such as here. This is um, the vessel which outlines the, the brain, so to speak. And we try to have this one in the field of view while we have this one in the field of view, again, because they mirror each other anatomically. And then, um, so I, I do this a few times just to make sure it, it's not kind of um, too much of an angle. And if you go through, you will see that lots of these vessels like here and here, they're really mirrored to the left and the right. And so you can use these kind of guides to say um, how well you are aligned in, in terms of angle of the fish. And then if you um, go at the bottom, like, like I said, we use this vessel as a cutoff to say this is our ventral. So I will always make sure that this complete vessel is being acquired. So I set my start here. And if I go through the sample at, at this here, I make sure that all these vessels will be acquired as well, because these are the most daughter ones. And this is where I then just set my end point of acquisition here. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. OK. Um, right. Also, someone said acquisition, light sheet, microscopy, like on the whiteboard. Was that the question or was that something else? I know that was the question. Thanks. Cool. Are there any other questions on light sheet um, and data acquisition? Yeah. OK. The thing is that I'm not super familiar with light sheet microscopy, so I think that I would have too many questions, so maybe Maybe afterwards, uh, since we have your email and you have some time, you can 
answers. Yes, you I'm should not... get familiar. It's an amazing technique. <laughs> I agree. The thing um, is, I suppose it's an amazing technique also when, when you have the, the freedom to actually play a little bit with a microscope. Yes. But in yes, my yes. case, the imaging core is pretty expensive on the microscope. So <laughs> normally, usually you want to go to the microscopes you already know how to use. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the thing is also where, I don't know if you guys are actually on, on Gather Town, if you have tried this thing from the conference. Um, so there are these common common social times, these two hour slots, and I will try and be there as much as possible. So if, if any of you wants to chat there or also like have a chat afterwards after this, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation or any other. Inside time. your hut or <clears throat> around the island? Um, I'll probably kind of have a nosy around and then just sit in my hand <laughs> stuff while I wait um, if yeah. something comes or not. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to. You can also just um, on, on Slack, you can just be like, I'm going on Gather Town or can you have a Zoom call? I'm more than happy to do that. Um, I've kept the yeah. three days free. So if anyone has questions. Um, That's amazing, stuff. Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank more you. Than welcome. And then also like obviously the question is like vessels with different thicknesses. So yes, um, like we discussed before, what you could try is actually a so-called multi-scale approach and, and look at uh, different filtering sizes and then multiplying them and integrating them. You can also look at um, something that is not based on geometry. So like we use this tube filter, but you can, uh, like I mentioned before, you can use, for example, median filter. You can use different general filtering processes, which are not specific to vessels. So for example, um, in the case of like the astrocytes, you would not use a tubeless filter because astrocytes are not tubes. Right, so, so you, would, you would use something that is more specific to, to your, your own structure of interest, um, if that makes sense. And then um, also one question was about synapses. So was that about like the astrocytes? Was that from you, Shutin? Okay. That was, that was from me. Okay, can you just um, repeat like what the question was or what you were interested in? In being able to include synapses and not eliminate them during the tubular. I guess it's similar to what you just said, was you'd select a different filter than the tubular uh, filter. Yes, and especially with synapses, they're like, they're very, very small. So you probably want to consider like the different scale. So that's something that, that we kind of look at at the moment as well. Cause like, if you look at a complete cell, like you see on my, on my background, you have uh, the synapses would be kind of in the center where you see this, this very dense kind of region. So this is where, where the synapses sit in, in the cells in the retina. But if you compare this region, they are really, really far smaller than anything else in the image. So we, in this case, we would need like a multi-scale approach to say, we look at the synapses at the very fine point and when we kind of uh, look at, for example, the complete cell. Um, so it's like having two different approaches or even having two different streams in the analysis, you can look at the complete cell first and then actually zoom in just on, on your synapses and then just look at them in more detail. So it's all how you want to set it up and what really makes sense for your data. Um, and again, a lot of trialing and a lot of error will tell you what works and what doesn't work. Um, great, was that all the questions? Or did I miss anything? All good? Okay. Does anyone have other questions on top of all of this? I, I don't have a question, more like I was just looking through the code and found some things that I just want to tell you. Uh, but it's but it's like it's optional stuff, so yeah. okay. if the, um, if no one has anything, this is completely i think this is out of the focus of the yeah if you want uh, just to stick on we can um if you don't mind we can just stay on also like so if it's all right with everyone i would say we kind of wrap up the session a bit early if like i said if you have questions i'll be around um throughout the conference um most of us are in the same time zone so um i won't reply at like 2 a.m but um i will try and be around in, in slack and like other towns if you want to have a chat uh, just drop me a line. I'm more than happy to discuss specific things or just catch up on what we've done or things on the graphic user interface. More than happy to have a conversation. Um, and yeah, the the video or like the recording should be made available to all of you in the next few days, weeks. I don't know, but then you can catch up on, on if you have missed anything or if anything is unclear. 
I've also dropped a link into the chat to the large data set. So if you want to just play around with, with these data, so you can have a look at this too. Um, if there aren't any questions, I then just want to thank all of you really for participating and, and really taking out the time out of your schedule and, and really kind of asking all these really great questions and having a great discussion. And um, I hope you all kind of take away something useful from this. Um, I definitely did and I've learned really a lot. And like I said, it was really a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, and so with that, I just thank all of you. And if you um, yeah, just want to say bye, um, that will be nice. <laughs> Thank you so thank much. For the yeah. Trip. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I truly learned a lot.